right, I think we're going to get started. Welcome uh, to the, stake the second, the afternoon stakeholder session um, on protecting against climate threats and in particular adapting our land use regulations for climate change. I'm Katie Angarone, Associate Commissioner of Science and Policy. Um, I think before we jump in, I'm going to have our panel uh, from land use management introduce themselves. Ginger. We're all a little tired. We just did three hours of this, but we're excited. Yeah. Yep. A little bit of coffee. Okay, thank you very much for being here with us. We had some great discussion um, in the morning session and I look forward to some great discussion with you today. Um, I just wanna give you a brief overview of, of how we got where we are and where we're headed. Um, in January, uh, Governor Murphy issued Executive Order 100 um, and shortly thereafter, actually, I'm sorry, on the same day, uh, Commissioner McCabe uh, issued Administrative Order 2020-01. Um, those those uh, orders were motivated by some very good science um, that our colleagues at Rutgers did for us in large part um, that we'll talk about in a minute. One of our principles here at the department is to make our decisions based on the best available science and also to follow the law. And so today, um, we are seeking to figure out how to integrate climate change considerations into our rules as directed by Governor Phil Murphy. Um, the AO also requires us to uh, change those, uh, get those climate change considerations into our land use rules. And those considerations include things like sea level rise, chronic flooding, and resiliency strategy, among other things. So today we're really here to hear from you um, and I just want to share with you some of the information from that report at Rutgers. As I said, our principle is to use the best available science. And what we know is that sea level rise is already happening. From 1911 to 2019, uh, sea level ro rose 17.6 inches and almost half of that occurred in the last 40 years. The New Jersey coastal areas, uh, um, according to this report, are likely, at least 66% chance, to experience a sea level rise from half a foot to 1.1 foot between 2000 and 2030, and then up to two feet by 2050. And what we know from this report is that what is predicted to happen between now and 2050 cannot be changed. The greenhouse gases affecting these scenarios have already been released. This is dramatic and this is sobering. And unlike other environmental issues that we have faced, we have scientific data to know that climate change is here and it will continue for many years. We therefore have a responsibility as evidenced by the governor's um, executive order to plan and prepare accordingly. We know that that is good policy. And as we are starting to see in the private sector, we also know that that is good business practice. So that's why we're here today we have an aggressive rule schedule, which uh, Assistant Commissioner Kopkash will go over. And I just wanna underscore that we understand that this work is essential. Uh, we need to get New Jersey ready to respond and adapt to climate change. We cannot do it alone. These are big tasks. There will be a lot of big questions today. And so we need to hear from you. We need your input. And so I thank you very much for being here to help us navigate this. The work we're embarking on is absolutely critical and it is essential. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Assistant Commissioner Kopkash who will give us sort of the rules of the road as well as a roadmap for where we're headed today. And I encourage you to um, think big and give us all of your great ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, <clears throat> The uh, AO and the, the EO and the AO 
um, included some pretty aggressive timelines for um, uh, the department to enter into rulemaking and to adopt regulatory changes that were mindful of um, uh, the governor's mission to um, address climate change into our regulations. So this is the first land use stakeholder meeting that we are conducting today. Actually, we had one earlier today, but this is the first session. Probably there will be more sessions. Um, there will be, at a minimum, at least some work groups on topic-specific regulatory changes. Um, the stakeholding will take place this year, this spring. Uh, we're going to enter into writing during the late spring, summer, with an anticipated proposal going out this late fall, early winter. By the end of the year, at a minimum, we are to be um, proposing rules. And then uh, we have one year to adopt them, so that would be winter 2021. Uh, these are the main rules that we'll be stakeholdering today. It doesn't mean there aren't other regulatory changes that um, need to happen. There's a lot of changes, though, within these rules that we need to take comments on today. So we have our coastal zone management rules, our flood hazard area protection act rules, our freshwater wetland protection act rules, as well as our stormwater rules, which are implemented through the land use permitting program. So we are going to be taking comments on them. Today's meeting is going to be Skyped and recorded and posted on DEP's NJPAC website. We will also be having um, allowing for the electronic submission of comments. That is not operational today, but will be soon. In the meantime, if you have additional comments you want to make, you go back, you think about it. We welcome them. Please email them to Jill Aspinwall. We're asking for one point person to receive those emails in order to best manage them. So Jill's uh, email address is also available on the website. She was the person you were to RSVP to. Um, but if you have any questions, come see me after this is done, and I will make sure you get her email address. So with that, we're going to begin our session. Vince Mazai from um, the Land Use Regulation Program will begin the conversation about resiliency. Good afternoon. <laughs> Same thing happened this morning. I don't know. All right. I'm very glad that you're all here. This is obviously an extremely important topic, and um, we're thankful that we can hear your thoughts on this. What we envision is a robust conversation that deals with all the different facets of this problem, which are many. Um, I think the flood hazard rule is a great place to start because uh, the whole premise of the flood hazard rule is to say, here's an area of the state, a rather large area of the state, that we know is at risk periodically from flood events. And with climate change, that's only going to get worse. Um, FEMA estimates that about 35% of New Jersey lies within what we call the 100-year flood, which is really a misnomer. It's not a flood that happens every 100 years. It's a flood that has a 1% chance of happening in any given year, at least based on prior data, which we'll talk about. Um, and the first place that I think we need to start is what floodplain should we be regulating? Is the existing methods that we have appropriate? Does that capture all the, the risk areas? Or should we expand it to account for climate change? Um, the this current flood hazard rule defines the design flood, which is what we call the flood that we regulate in New Jersey, differently in fluvial areas than tidal areas. So fluvial is riverine systems, non-tidal. In fluvial areas, based on a 1974 uh, recommendation by the New Jersey Water Supply Council at the time, we take the 100-year flow rate and add 25% to it, and then we calculate where that floodplain is going to be. And through the rules, we, we always say that that's got to be at least one foot above FEMA's 100-year flood, or, or BFE, base flood elevation. Uh, in tidal areas, though, we just look to FEMA's BFE. So 
there are a few things that we can unpack with this. Is, is the 100 year plus something the best way to go? Is it appropriate in both tidal and fluvial areas? Should we go to a different recurrence interval like a 500 year flood, which is mapped and obtainable? Or should we take 100 year and add several feet to it? And, and, and to show you what that would look like, I'll come back to the slide, but let's say that's uh, your home. I hope it isn't because it's in the flood zone. Um, so that's the existing flood plain. And so if, as, as climate change causes greater precipitation and bigger flood plains, they, it not only goes up, it goes out. And that was the main point of illustrating this, was that a larger land area is, is captured. And so if you're in that zone between today's flood hazard area and tomorrow's flood hazard area, you're not, you don't need flood insurance. You're not covered by any regulations that would prevent you from having a basement or make the road elevated or, or so on and so on. So, and here's a good illustration, and I'll go back to that slide so we can remember our, our talking points. But this is Long Branch. This is the existing FEMA map. It's the colorized version that's on the Map Service Center. And the blue areas, the bluish green areas, represent the existing 100-year floodplain. And the kind of goldish orangey color is the existing 500-year floodplain. So you can see there's a lot of areas. Like if you're in that, in that gold area, uh, you know, obviously you're subject to CAFR and other things, but you're not subject to the flood hazard regulations. So things like floor elevations, building access, all that kind of stuff wouldn't apply to you. So let's, let's go back to this slide because I'd like to hear your thoughts on what flood is the right flood to be regulating. And then we can talk about what sorts of uses would be appropriate in those areas. Well, good afternoon, Vince. Uh, this is Mike Pissarro from the Watershed Institute. Just if you could clarify the 100-year flood if I understand correctly, at least in the stormwater rules, and I guess the flood hazard rules, it's a 106 year average that ended in 2006 from a NOAA uh, atlas. So if you were to forward think that 100 year flood, at least you know to the current weighted average, you maybe not go back as far, what would that flood hazard area look like if you went back, you know, 40 years mm -hmm. versus 106? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a great question. And, and that's gets to the crux of this is that, is that we have a few levels of iteration. There's, there's the flood that will actually happen, right? There's the flood that we calculate. And the way we calculate it is based on rainfall data and precipitation data and other things that go back, like you said, 100 years. Um, so one thing that we need to look at is, is the progression and the change in the 100-year event or whatever recurrence interval we pick. Um, when, when I first started with the department, the, in 1988, the 100-year the flood was, was a or the 100-year storm was 7.5 inches of rain in a 24-hour period. Now, depending on what county you're in, it's 8 point something, sometimes it's over 9 inches. And some of that's because we have, we have a longer span of data, so it's more accurate. But I think it also captures the fact that it's changing, right? Um, so, so yeah, we I believe that we need to look back at that precipitation data and see what's appropriate, and have conversations with NOAA because we get their we get the data from them, and see you know how often they're revisiting it. I certainly think that the we should go to a 500-year flood without any question. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 19, uh, late 1960s, a new bridge was built uh, just downstream, and it's essentially a dike, which is a detention basin. And ever since then, there has been substantial flooding because the bridge opening was designed for a 100-year flood, and that is obviously not 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 adequate. And I also would agree with what the Watershed Institute has said. We need to look at the more recent data rather than going all the way back 106 years or whatever it was, uh, because there's no question that it's, it's really sped up mm -hmm. uh, enormously. I think that even with a 500-year flood, though, the safety factor is also required. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other issues involved in, in, in doing this uh, also. 
um, and I think that one does have to also consider what happens with historic buildings <laughs> and so on. Um, there are the historic preservation office has put out and had conferences and so on involving what it, it always involves raising the structure. Mm -hmm. uh, raising the structure changes the context of the building to the land completely, uh, and, and it, it is often really inappropriate. Um, but um, it's the only only way that can be done, and it's the only way that flood insurance accepts as well. Mm -hmm. Other methods, such as allowing a building to be designed so that it can accommodate a flood and only needs cleanup rather than re rebuilding, mm -hmm. should be considered. Uh, and I think that uh, it's really important also in terms of having larger openings under bridges and so on, which allow wildlife guardage to to be continuous as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I'm right here. Yes, I think there are other things to be considered apart from rainfall, and that has to do with impervious surfaces, mm -hmm. because clearly it makes a big difference. Um, we already have a problem with flooding because of development in the last 30 some years that we've lived also along the Millstone River <coughs> in a historic property. And the, the way of managing stormwater was insufficient 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. The use of detention basins which hold water for a very short time and then release it when roads are totally flooded and the river and the DNR canal is one huge lake at Grigstown. And then detention basins are empty, the roads are still flooded. Mm -hmm. And this goes back 35 years ago when most of the area surrounding us was farmland. Mm -hmm. Now it's developed. And so we have a couple of things that we have to consider. One, that the weather and the storms will be more dramatic going forward. But the rules that apply now and have applied are inadequate to deal with what we already have, mm -hmm. which is flooding and stormwater management that needs to be totally reassessed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your points are well taken. The, uh, we're we're going to def we're going to definitely dive into all those aspects during this conversation. Is our hope we have a few slides that deal specifically with stormwater management. Um, it's, it's such a big topic, we tried to break it down into pieces and say, well, you know, what floods should we look at and, and you know, what, what, how should we come up with that, that flood? What's the best way to analyze it? And then what should we allow in that? And then how should we manage stormwater? So those are all important factors. Yes, sir. Hey, Vince. Bill hey. Kilbert, Rarton, Ed Waters. This is a great question to start out with. And it, I guess it occurs to me that we don't know what flood we should be looking at if we don't know what the threat is going to look like 50 or 100 years out, whatever our planning horizon is. Um, has the department or Rutgers or the state climatologist or anyone that you know of done good modeling to give us an idea of what, because we've got good, we've got pretty good maps for what the, the flood prone areas look like now. Do we have modeling that gives us a good idea of what those are likely to look like 50 to 100 years out? So along the coast, it's, it's different whether it's riverine or coastal. So Yeah, I'm inland. I don't care about the coast. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> it's only half the state. So right. um, there, there was a study that I, I can't, I'm, gonna tr I'm trying to get a hold of it. I was talking to um, John Miller from FEMA about this because he had told me about the study that suggested that over a certain period of time that fluvial discharges would increase by roughly 40, uh, upwards of 43% was the number that I recall. I don't remember what the time frame was, um, and I don't know like how they. I don't know what what um, data that was based on, but that's that's about the only study that I know of that specifically targets what the fluvial impact would be from a warmer climate, uh, you know, larger precipitations. I mean, we could take we could take rainfall data. We could say, okay, let's say it's nine inches is a hundred year storm now. We could try to project it out and say, well, in 2070 we think it's going to be 12 inches and then try to model based on that. Um, but then all the existing flood maps go out the window because... Well, and I think that's a, I think that would be a good conversation to have with David Robinson or, or whoever the appropriate folks are because when we do 
municipal planning, when we're putting together a municipal master plan and, and zoning, we don't base it on what our community looked like in 1950. We do it based on what we think our community is going to look like 50 years out, mm -hmm. what, what we want the community to look like 50 years from now. You know, hypothetically, if we had an up-to-date state master plan, we'd be doing the same thing. When you're, when you're planning, you're projecting forward what your community is going to look like and what issues you're going to be addressing. And, well, you know, those sorts of things, and you don't do that based on what's outdated data, frankly. Uh, it, kind of to reiterate what Mike was saying earlier, so I, I feel like we need to, f I realize that this is not entirely a regulatory issue, but we need, uh, on the science side, we need to f find some way to model what this looks like in the future and, and base our regulations around that. Maybe a safe way to do that is to do the 500-year flood. Clearly, the 100-year flood doesn't cut it because it's, no longer the hundred year flood. Um, so that's my thoughts. Thanks. Thank you. I've got one. Uh, Stan Hales, Barnaga Bay Partnership. Water still flows downhill, so I do care what happens <laughs> along the coast. Um, I think this is a fine starting point, but I think an important thing to keep in mind when you say we want to build resiliency into flood prone, air, flood -prone areas. Are you trying to get people out of flood-prone areas or make it easier to live in a flood-prone area? And the answer to that question affects a lot of what you choose and how you choose to do it. But I think that's a part of the conversation mm -hmm. that's been much harder to have, especially along the shore. Mm -hmm. You know, if you tell everybody they have to get out of a thousand-year floodplain, you're, you know, vacating much of the coast. and. Mm -hmm. We probably don't want that, but I think you do have to know who's vulnerable at what point in time because the other programs and the costs, which we all share in some way, will have to be sorted out. So, you know, as a little kid, I love playing in the street with six inches of water on it. All I could ruin is my bicycle, but if it floods out my basement, it, you know, it's a different level of risk, and I think... Um, recognition of how much of the population in different areas needs to be somehow in, incorporated into this. Thank you. Hey, Vince. Ray Nichols. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, just to answer this question quickly. So the current models for flood plane calculations, design floods, take into account topography? Yes. So, so there's the two parts of it. There's the hydrology, how much water is getting there. And then there's the hydraulics, which is what's going to happen in the riverine system when the water does get there, right? right? So both of those things are based on topography to at least the, the geometry part it certainly is. The well, hydrology I'm, I'm is thinking in terms extent. of um, the coastal plain versus mm -hmm. the rest of the state, mm -hmm. where I know the Stony Brook, it's flashy. The county has rebuilt two bridges in the last 20 years, and they flood regularly because the calculations didn't take into account the slope of the watershed area. And um, we now can get much better topography data than we could 20, 30 years ago. Right. And uh, I think that needs to be taken into account as well as impervious area and ultimate build out. Mm -hmm. But the topography, so there's almost like three different areas in the state. There's the coastal, which is um, ocean flooding or bay flooding. There's fluvial in the coastal plain, mm -hmm. and then there's fluvial in the northern part of the state, mm -hmm. you know, route one north. Right. Thank you. Yeah, and, and you're right that the, the average slope of the watershed is a huge factor in it. Um, there have been some studies that show that. And that's why in, uh, in the coastal areas, there's, there's different rainfall uh, curves, let's say, than there are in other parts of the state because, because of the response of the ground and the slope of the watershed. So, but you're right. You know, there's never been a targeted study of that that I know of. So, hi. My name is Deborah Coyle McFadden. I'm with New Jersey Work Environment Council. Um, and as we're looking at 500, 100 year or other, and we're talking about resiliency, I mean, I would just caution um, depending what you're looking at. So as we're talking about inland, we also have to think about the industry there, right? We have a lot of industry inland on the water. 
um, and we can take some lessons learned from what happened in Arkema in Crosby, Texas, where it was a 500-year flood. They got 40 inches of rain in less than uh, 40, 48 hours. There were toxic releases. Emergency responders had to go to the hospital. So I just think we need to think about this, and we need to think about toxic chemicals, and not just for the large facilities that are located maybe closer to the water, but any resiliency planning also needs to take in components of smaller, smaller facilities, like during Sandy, um, when they had the flooding, you had uh, dry cleaners that were flooded, auto repair shops. So I know it's a little off topic, but I think it's a really important piece as we're looking at resiliency. Mm. Agreed. Right. Talking points, yeah. Hi, uh, Brian Kemp, New Jersey Association for uh, Floodplain Management. Um, is there a way to uh, peg the uh, design flood to a moving target so it's not, we're not like waiting for FEMA to come out with new flood maps so that as sea level rises and if there's, like if there's a shelf collapse and there's a sudden increase, um, that instead of just having a built-in freeboard, you can have it incorporate, excuse me, incorporated by reference so it keeps increasing. Like automatically changes right, at, right. with with the release of maybe new cli climate change data. Is that what you mean, or, or correct? With, without ri without having to go through the the rulemaking process all over again every time the mm. um, the estimates get increased. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, hadn't thought of that. It's an interesting idea. Hmm. One thing to keep in mind too with this conversation is that. Once we define that area that we want to regulate, then, then we can say these uses are appropriate or these uses are not appropriate, or here's where we want to rebuild, here's where we want, where we want to retreat, here's where we want to elevate, here's where we want to abandon, or, you know, those, those, all those complicated, fast, wonderful facets that we, that we need to wrestle with. Any more thoughts about the design flood? Um, we've, we've thought that the 500-year flood might be a good surrogate for the future 100-year flood because it's mapped in a lot of areas, so people have access to the data. So you, you know, the, one of the one of the challenges that we have, and this was the case with some of our older flood hazard rules, is that it it really didn't let you use mapping resources unless it was a state map. You needed to calculate it yourself in a lot of cases, and so if you're a homeowner, you know, it's beyond your means to be able to do something like that. It's hard to know what the risk is going to be uh, for you. So. We tried to we try to tie it into mapping, but like I like to say, the flood doesn't know it's supposed to stop at the line on the map. So, knowing your relative risk is very important. So, Vince, again, you know, if if our data, whether it's a hundred year, five hundred year, or a thousand year storm, is pegged on data that is at this point uh, fourteen years old and heavily weighted towards the past you're sort of, we're sort of building in sort of an inaccuracy in that we're not a dealing with what's really occurring now, nor are we dealing with what we think may occur in the future. Mm -hmm. So at the very least, I think DEP and people need to get a handle of what those numbers would really look like if they were weighted towards the present. And then we can figure out what we should do with the future because we really should incorporate the future but again, relying on data that is, you know, from 1900, 1910, and 1920 really tells us, as Bill said, nothing about the future. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think to further this conversation, we need to figure out what those numbers are mm -hmm. and what they look like now. Hi, I'm Patty. Whoa. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I'm Patty Kronheim, and I want to ag agree with Rethink Energy New Jersey. I want to agree with uh, Mike and what others have said. We don't know what we don't know. I mean, that's really the bottom line here. We see these huge changes, for instance, in temperature that we didn't really expect. We didn't expect this kind of uh, report from Rutgers to show this kind of a sea level rise. And when it comes to flood hazards and when it comes to, to stormwater and all of the, um, and the wetlands and all of these different co coastal rules, we don't know how bad and how quickly this will be. So I think it's really important that we build in, if we're, Canoptic here is resiliency, we're resilient in how we determine what the risk is. So we have to have some kind of a interactive and non-static way of saying 
what is you know where is the flood plains but i think it also speaks to a larger point that we need to really start thinking of you know of watersheds we need to start thinking of this holistically i know mike will agree with me on this one but we need to really look at our flood hazard plans and look upstream not just look at the flood hazards but really look at you know how does the storm water what happens upstream and to have a real comprehensive look in general with all of these rules and everything we're going to be discussing today um, it's i think it's just really important that we take a comprehensive look at all of these rules together and we start with our intentions you know so before we even dive into rules what are the intentions we're protecting drinking water right we're increasing resiliency right we want to have safety everything that happens upstream in flood hazards we know about the algae blooms and the, and the lakes and so forth that's these are the basic intentions carbon sequestration and then of course decreasing you know emissions as well which which land use can impact a lot, especially if you want to expand uh, public benefit under Wetlands Act and so forth. So I just want to just make a plug for a comprehensive looking at these as watersheds and try to be as resilient in all of our measurements with this and know that we don't know what we don't know. Thank you. Sorry. To, to keep in mind is that there are so many storm facilities that have already been constructed uh, and they've been constructed with a hundred year flood not and there needs to be in addition to a change in the rules a program that will somehow retrofit these facilities mm -hmm. so that they can accommodate the, the storm water uh, that, that's coming in mm -hmm. Hi, Sue Quackenbush, Amy Green, Environmental. Um, I just want to bring it back to the practitioner side because um, you know we've been talking a lot about best available science or best prediction of science. And fr from what Ginger explained in the beginning, it doesn't look like we have time with the rule changes to model out and predict and redo maps. So from a practitioner point of view, the decision has to be made on the best available science or the best prediction we can make on the timeline with what's available, but it also has to be implementable. So people need to be able to model that stream and uh, and design those bridge openings. And so I, I love the idea of it being able to change, having some of that flexibility built into the rules, but also let's not lose sight of the implementability, if that's a word, of, of what we're doing. Great stuff. Keep it coming. In the back of the room. Hi, uh, Dominic Lukenhoff with Hugo New. Um, yeah, full disclosure, a career EPA person that retired working in water programs, and thanks for having us here. Uh, agree with the, the comments that were just said in terms of looking at watershed-based approaches, um, even um, sort of a, a cross-section of eco-regions and what's happening. Um, our, our site, we have a 130-acre site, um, industrial corridor between uh, Hackensack and Passaic Rivers. We, we have raised, we're raising the site as we rede redevelop it adaptively for addressing resiliency, building in 50% more stormwater management. In fact, that we, we aren't regulated, but it'll help with that, the lower Passaic watershed in that area. Um, we're raising the site 16 feet, four feet above FEMA. I guess my question is, because we, we continue to ask ourselves, if, looking at a regional standpoint, what's our impact? What's our positive impact, our negative impact? How do we re remove any negative but in, increase um, the positive where we get regenerative restoration, for example, wetlands. We're restoring um, uh, a number of the marsh areas uh, for addressing storm surge. What's our incentive? So how will these rules um, for those that are ready to acknowledge that the floodplain maps that we've had don't give us anything, and we are in a new day and age, particularly as it relates to, to land development and geomorphological changes. So for those that want to build in for additional resiliency, um, 
some incentive uh, to address that. I know the insurance companies are going to catch up with this at some point. They certainly are now, but it would be nice to have something like that in the rulemaking. Mm. Thank you. So let's let's transition, and we can obviously, as, as you think of ideas uh, related to the to the flood hazard area definition, uh, let's transition into the types of things or the standards that we would we would focus on if uh, in this regulated area. Again, this is uh, today's condition. Here is ex today's existing flood hazard area. Our concern is the future flood hazard area. We don't know what the delta is. Maybe in some cases, in, in between the two, and that's what we're talking about. Um, the people that are in between the existing and future floodplain limits are the ones that we're feeling today are at risk because even though they're not in a flood zone today, at some point they will be. And again, for those who came in late, this, this shows the existing 100-year and 500-year flood plain limits in Long Branch. So you can see large parts of the community are not in the 100-year floodplain but are in the 500-year floodplain. So let's talk about the types of standards that are appropriate for buildings and roads, you know, infrastructure, uh, hospitals, Wawa's, that sort of thing. Is it enough to elevate? So once we pick this design flood elevation, once we determine it based on our data, then how, how high above that do we want people to go? Um, the sweet spot with FEMA flood insurance seems to be about three feet above the base flood elevation. That's about the maximum amount of, of savings above that. I don't think you get additional savings off your flood insurance. So should it be the design flood plus three. Should it be, should we say certain types of uses just are not appropriate in these areas? Someone earlier in the, this morning session spoke about a tiered approach by, by saying maybe we look at the floodplain as different discrete zones. And this part here, we allow certain things. And this part, we allow other things. And this part, we allow further things. So it could be that too. That's all the time we have for questions now? No. Uh, <laughs> well, it was a nice, round, easily accessible number. And, and there is data, right, that's, that shows that every foot up you go is, is better, right? Um, earlier today, I spoke about a statistic where for every foot up you go with construction, depending whether it's masonry or wood frame or whatever, <clears throat> it adds about a half a percent to 1% to the cost of the building itself, right? But that's made up within four to six years by flood insurance savings, right? So even if you went up three feet, you'd get all that money back, all that initial investment back, and then for the lifetime of the structure, you'd be saving tens of thousands of dollars on flood, just on flood insurance. So um, it does beg the question as to where the one foot came from and is it enough? So Vince, as long as you're dealing with difficult questions, <laughs> why, why, does, uh, why does the insurance industry use three feet? I, I, I'm sure th there's no way that's random because actuaries are math geeks and I know yeah. that they did some calculations. There's gotta be a reason that the savings plateau at three feet. Yeah, my understanding is that when they looked at the data that there was enough difference between BFE and plus one, plus two, plus three, but it pe starts petering out. The, the It's sort of asymptotic, let's say. So that's, they just cut it off at that point. I think probably because most they didn't have a lot of data on the flood impact to buildings that were over three feet higher than the BFE. So I think it was a combination of lack of data and um, and just you know not getting the bang for your buck. They also don't particularly have incentive to have additional reduced rates, right? So in other words, if they, if you get up to a certain point where they feel that you're, you're meeting the, um, the minimal risk, let's say, there's really no incentive for them to give you further flood insurance savings based on going higher. So. A good point. Yeah. One one of the things too is, um, let's say that you or and I were, are building a house in a flood zone and we're investing the money. We can make the determination that it's worth the extra money to go up, right? Um, if 
most houses aren't built by, or warehouses are built by, you know, most buildings are not built by the end user. Somebody else is making those choices, and those choices are usually economic driven. And those folks don't have to pay the flood insurance. So that's why we've, we've got to tie those two things together. To your point. Okay, there isn't any point in building in a floodplain, anything new. How much of New Jersey would be undevelopable? Well, FEMA estimated that about 35% of New Jersey lies within a 100-year floodplain. That's flood maps that are sometimes 30, 40 years old, for, based on old data, and not all floodplains are mapped. So probably 40% upwards of the state is what we're talking about. And it's a lot of very developed areas, like every town center has a stream on it, right, that's going through it. Every, every town has a river or a stream, and that's why it was built there, because of water. So. Going forward, how much of New Jersey should not be built on, theoretically, because it is a floodplain? Not, not, not counting what's already there, going forward. And that is the question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to that well, question. Well, how does one come up with the answer to that? That's why we're here. Yeah, no, in all seriousness, um, we're trying to weigh all the different balances because we could say, sure, no more development on 100-year floodplain. What would, what would that do to the economy of the state? Is that, is that, a, is that a good trade-off? Should we just say 100% this way or 100% that way? Normally, regulations try to strike a balance between some things and recognizing that you have entire communities that are completely in a flood zone. So should we not let them have a hospital? Should we, you know, if somebody's house is destroyed or or um, you know, burns down, should they not be able to rebuild it? Those are the hard, hard questions that we have to ask. And it's, there, there are no easy answers, unfortunately. Yeah. So basically, this is a philosophical problem. No, so not at all. It's a geographic problem and a water Oh, yes, absolutely, in the, sense, in the sense that we're looking for real answers. And there are a lot of different aspects and facets that we have to weigh in the conversation. Because like I said, any one thing that we do is going to have an impact in some other area. And so trying to find that appropriate balance is, yeah, you're absolutely right. Judy Mine at uh, Jersey Sierra Club. Um, I think it's not hypothetical at all, and it's not, it's worthy of mention that if we don't allow development in an increasingly large area, which is designated floodplain, where's that development going to go? It's going to go to other areas of New Jersey, which is going to increase the impermeable surface in New Jersey, going to create runoff toxic runoff that's going to end up in those floodplain areas too. So it's all a very interactive system and we can't really consider any one decision without looking at what are the consequences mm -hmm. going to be. Patty Kronheim and I want to agree wholeheartedly with the last statement and also that th these, you know, we have a lot of traditional communities that are in, are in floodplains and we need to work with those communities as well. And I think one of the things that would be really helpful is when you have mapping and as hopefully you develop modeling for flooding, uh, whether it's coastal or, or inland, that that is all you know, highly available and visible to the public because the public needs to know what's at stake and what's, and what's likely to happen. So I think that it needs to, the DEP needs to be very conscious of making this an interactive mm. uh, process with the public. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, resiliency is looking forward. And uh, the Europeans, when they look forward, look at the precautionary principle. In other words, let's be precautionary in what we do rather than reactionary. After umpteen million people have been flooded out, um, all the expensive infrastructure on the barrier islands is permanently inundated. Uh, let's pr be precautionary and look ahead a number of years. The rules don't get re rewritten every five years. It would be nice if they did. They're supposed to. It doesn't happen that way. Reality is. And with respect to um, the current scenario that the rules 
won't get finalized until sometime in the fall or winter of 2021, isn't that about the time there's an election for a new governor? And I can imagine that becoming a political issue and the governor could say, uh, hey, Virginia, why don't you wait until after election day to publish the final rules so it doesn't become a uh, political hot potato? Um, and do we have that much time? Now, I heard that all the comments we make, uh, if, you want, if you don't hear them today and collect them, we can send them into one person, poor Jill is going to be getting comments over hundreds of pages of existing rules. I know you, you budget a year to take care of analyzing those comments, deciding which ones you can address. You should address it all in one way or another. Um, you know, should have more stakeholder meetings. Uh, somebody suggested this morning that uh, as soon as you have something drafted, uh, you provide stakeholders with the opportunity to review it. So we're not just talking about what we know about past rules. Uh, but the precautionary principle is very important. The second thing that uh, I don't recall land use regulation doing very much of, although other divisions in the department have, is hiring temporary employees that work less than half time. They don't have to give them benefits. Um, there are a number of retired DEP employees. I'm not asking for a job myself. I'm very happily retired without one. Um, but if you hired a number of people who have experience with some of these rules or with rule writing uh, for other parts of the department or lawyers who are somewhat retired, you could get the data that you're gonna be collecting in the very near future analyzed much faster and you could then have these newbies, part-timers, drafting language that is consistent with what you want to get. And then those of you in supervisory positions and the legal beagles could review text a lot faster and you could speed up the timeline under which rules are promulgated in final form. So that would be in everybody's best interest, especially given the urgency that the people who are studying climate change are bringing to our attention with increasing urgency as time goes on. It's a crisis. Deal with it. Thanks, Ray. Any other thoughts about this? There's uh, some, not only just the, the lowest floor of the DFD, or the what we call free board, but also you know, dry flood proofing versus wet flood proofing, where, where are these appropriate? Those are things that we have to decide too. Because you can have an historic building that you can't elevate. And so do we wet flood proof it or you know, how do we deal with it? Hi, Peter Blair, Clean Ocean Action. Is there going to be an interest from the DEP or an effort to incorporate the different rules and make an overlapping regulatory system? We keep going back to uh, stormwater and obviously the flood issue. Could we, you know, increase the stormwater rules to be more stringent in a flood hazard area to account for that risk? Yes, we can, and, and we'll definitely get to that. Okay. Uh, I'm looking forward to your thoughts on that a few slides from now. So I may be jumping ahead, but, you know, in the flood hazard rules and the wetlands rules, and I don't remember the CAFRA rules, but there's a bunch of general permits, permits by rule, permits by certification that allow reconstruction allow enlargement uh, you know, in various circumstances. But you know, when you are allowing someone to enlarge into the riparian zone or into the flood hazard area, you're putting them in further risk. And none of those general permits require showing that that was the only area I could enlarge in. So if I'm allowed, if I can enlarge into the uplands, the general permit doesn't require me to show that that's not an option. Mm -hmm. Doesn't require me to go try to get a variance in order to do it. So, you know, you're putting people, you know, you're allowing people to put themselves in risk. You know, there's probably a different calculation about rebuilding or, you know, renovating an existing structure just from the economics and fairness of the issue. You know, we can get into that philosophical debate, but, you know, getting people to enlarge in those areas, not only putting those people in, you know, people who did it, but also people upstream and downstream, because you've impacted the riparian zone, you've collected the 
the impact of the floodway, so now you have impediment or you have more water coming off. Uh, there should, you know, sort of like in the flood hazard, uh, not the flood hazard, the wetlands rules, where if the wetlands rules would sort of regulate into inutility that lot, then you, you can get a permit, but these general permits need to be rethought so that the first go is not going further into damage, but trying to move away. Avoid, minimize, mitigate. Yeah. Any more thoughts about this topic? Okay, I've got to add one more. Oh, um, please. Thank you. If, if we're looking at um, riparian areas or locational kinds of uh, sensitivities, hazardous waste sites, Superfund sites, NPL sites, um, that's going to increase the, we're talking about risk. So with increased flooding and um, storm surge and impact um, and deteriorated infrastructure comes the challenge of deteriorated sites and um, greater harm by by toxic release uh, if we're you know particularly if we're going to use a mapping system a GIS driven mapping system there's no reason not to include um, those impacts those stressors um, in evaluating whether or not somebody continues to build out mm. speaking of risk and harm mm. thank you just a quick question, Vince. I'm looking at the slide that you have up. Are, how have the existing rules worked so far? Do, have you seen that the provisions that are in the existing rules, like the, the wet flood proofing or the dry flood proofing, have you seen that one scenario works more than the other, or are there lessons learned from the implementation of the 2007 rules? Yeah, it's, it's not, not an easy, as easy an answer as we would hope it to be, because it's difficult to, to say that this structure that maybe hasn't gotten flooded yet is going to be at less risk. I mean, we, we know we know that it's better, but how much better is very difficult. Um, for let's say since you brought up dry flow proofing, wet flow proofing, we found that from an economic point of view, that about three feet is pretty much the limit for dry flood proofing before it becomes in most buildings not economically feasible. I mean, you could theoretically you could make this whole room flood proof, but the thickness of the walls and the steel that you would need and the cost, it would, you know, wouldn't work. Um, wet flood proofing, as you know, lets the water in. Dry flood proofing basically means make it watertight. Wet flood proofing means you, you're letting the water in so that it balances the, the water on both sides so that way it's not, the hydrostatic pressure is not pressing up against the walls. Um, the other thing with about three feet with dry flood proofing is that once you get beyond that, the buoyancy forces sometimes are so great we had, we had an individual on the Muskegon River that wanted to put a second story addition on and they had a basement and they wanted to flood proof it and we had them calculate the buoyancy force and the buoyancy force of a wet flood proof basement was two and a half times the weight of the addition. So the house would have just gone bloop. So, so there's, a certain, there's certain practical considerations. Uh, wet flood proofing is, is limited to cases where it's like agricultural buildings, you know, um, water dependent uses, you know, non habitable uses in general. Um, but as, as uh, this gentleman pointed out, let's say it's a historic structure and you want to retrofit it and, and make it more resilient. Do we put flood vents in it and let the water come in or do we elevate it? You know? And I'm sure as technology advances, is there room, I, I can't remember how the rules are written right now, but do they allow for someone to come in with a novel technology and present that case to the department? Absolutely. For, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Sure. All right, let's, uh, again, nothing's off topic just because I move on to another slide, but um, let's transition, since we've had a lot of conversations about stormwater management, let's transition into that. So as we had mentioned, our calculations as to what storm events or flood events that we have, they're all based on precipitation data that's been collected over a certain period of time uh, that, that doesn't, some, some of the data is old enough that I think it predated some of the, the major impacts of climate change even because it went back so far. So, um, you know, and some of the methodologies that we use are based on those things. Like, for example, for the engineers in the audience, we have this thing called the rational method, as you know. It's based on, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's got some good, quick and dirty limited uses, but 
it's based on this data. Should we, for example, look at the t different methodologies that people use to calculate stormwater and say, this is preferred, or you shall use this, or you shall not use that? Um, that's kind of more of a technical d discussion, but any thoughts on that? Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, big surprise here. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan of using out moded data to try to plan for the future. Um, so whether we're talking about a 100-year floodplain or whatever floodplain we're going to design for, um, although I understand the value of using historical data if we're planning for what our state's going to look like 100 years for now, from now, we need to be planning for a climate 100 years from now, not the 1950 climate, not today's climate, but what we're going to be dealing with, or what somebody else, not we, but what somebody else is going to be dealing with 100 years from now. Um, because it doesn't do us any good to allow development in areas that are just going to wind up being um, the, the victims of, of climate 30, 40 years from now. You know, we, we, may, we already made this mistake 50 years ago, building in floodplains. Mm -hmm. Let's not repeat that um, by, by building in, you know, the existing floodplain today when that doesn't address where we're going to be 100 years from now. Thank you. Hi, uh, Wendy Walsh with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, on stormwater, I guess this is sort of also kind of a cross comment with um, freshwater wetlands. So as many of you in this room know, uh, we work a lot with freshwater wetlands uh, dependent species, migratory birds, and uh, federally listed species such as bog turtle and swamp pink. And so one of our comments is to try to look ahead. I've heard this comment many times about not just updating, rolling up the baseline to a more current time frame, but also then trying to project ahead. I realize you guys have a tight schedule and modeling is difficult, but if there are those kind of scaled down tools available specific to New Jersey or even to the Northeast, trying to look ahead at changing patterns of um, flooding, rainfall, and drought, not just from the stormwater um, perspective of sort of a flood protection, Right, but also the newer um, rules that we're requiring infiltration. So really looking at that connection between stormwater management and wetland health, um, infiltrating that water and allowing the wetlands um, to have a more stable and even hydrologic regime rather than the super flashy um, thing we all know the problems with, um, with urban wetlands and the, the really flashy the wetter wet and the, the drier dry that are really um, deleterious to a lot of the well independent species. Um, and the, you know, the same kind of comment is going <laughs> to, you'll hear it from us again for, for wetland buffers, is, is having to look ahead at what is a change in climate and are those buffers still adequate to protect those species. Um, yeah. Mm, thank you. Yeah, the storm, stormwater rules are a huge component to this because. Um, Think about the size of the state and the different areas that we regulate in flood hazard areas, wetlands, but a lot of the stormwater is coming from outside of those areas that are ending up in those areas. So that's why it's very important that we are accurate. Um, we also accommodate uh, different aspects in the rule. Uh, you might have noticed that in today's New Jersey Register, the green infrastructure rule was, was just uh, published. Um, so that will increase resiliency in a number of ways. But we can, we can go further. I mentioned before about removing the rational method as an example of the type of thing that, um, you know, the type of methodologies and kind of zoning, zoning in on the things that are predictive and not retrospective. Um, we can require municipalities to evaluate and consider climate change as part of their MS4 permit, right? Every municipality gets a permit from the state and the, st and the municipality is mandated to review stormwater impacts for major developments. Um, we can look at the water quality design storm and say, is that the right storm? It's an inch and a quarter of water in of rain in two hours. Is that the appropriate storm? Should we use a different design storm? Should we try to, should we, should we have the rules encourage people 
incentivize or require them to trap and infiltrate that water quality design storm. You know, these, are, these, are, these are all the types of things that we're thinking. So your thoughts? So Vince, uh, Mike Pissarro again. Uh, I wish I was here with John Miller and Mark Gallagher uh, talking about the engineering and the models because that's beyond my mind. Uh, but there's a couple things. So, you know, what we do upstream impacts downstream, and I know the stormwater management rules have regional stormwater management plans, which I thought until last week was a unicorn. Apparently, they may exist in some form somewhere. Um, but for DEP to create the incentives so we can have some more regional stormwater management plans would help because one of the things our stormwater management, the way things are designed is we sort of try all the basins sort of empty at the same time. So everything sort of floods. If we could design a system that sort of times those releases, you may help flooding downstream. Uh, retaining on site, whether it's the water quality design storm or something more, and whether that's infiltration, reuse with cisterns or green roofs, um, you're sort of reducing the volume down. Um, I think those things would be very useful. Um, and I think now that we're seeing sort of that, you know, more rain and more intense storms, it may not be, well, it is more over time, but you know, we're seeing them coming down more frequently. Um, having a way to sort of better protect from that pollution flushing um, would be very useful. And whether this is a climate change thing, but from a water quality perspective, we have TMDL plans that exist but aren't being implemented on a point source or our urban our stormwater management system so going in enforcing that again would help sort of reduce the volume reduce the pollution pollution loading um, and so whether that's the stormwater management rules which i know the phase two stormwater stakeholder process was talking about through the ms4 permit uh, again you're getting at not only quantity but quality as well Yeah, it's um, it's it's interesting because we we have these robust standards to say how things should be designed, and um, we don't hear back a lot of times from design professionals to how well they're working. Sometimes we do, um, you know. But you're right, staggering the basin timing for like a watershed approach—that's something that we spoke about this morning. Um, you know, we we we're working with our soil conservation folks so that we can understand whether or not uh, things are stable in a changing climate. You know, those are these are all all things that we need to fit together. Yeah. Oh, I'm it, sorry. Hi. Stan I'm Hales again, uh, Barnegat Bay Partnership. It's great to hear other people pick up on water quality. And I would just ask everybody room, everyone in the room here, do you, and I'm not trying to poke the department in the eye in any way. But I'd ask for an honest assessment of whether the entire program, as designed, is working as intended to protect water quality. And I think if you look at all of the issues, some might conclude there's room for improvement and that that be used to provide an additional level of protection. If we're reducing risk by requiring one foot higher, maybe to provide additional water quality protection we, spec, we step back from the water's edge a little more, wherever that edge is going to be. And I think that does give us, and I'm not saying we use a foot, but uh, I think that does, it would give us a little more protection for water quality built into the new system, however it's designed. I think there are other economic benefits to that, both in our spending a little less money on that, but it's also consistent with that resiliency prediction or protection that we desire. So uh, there's a little extra capacity to our stormwater protection. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know, the state's been moving in that direction, so I think it's something that's consistent w with what everybody wants to achieve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh. I think there was... Yeah, I was just going to follow up the, that systems approach in terms of looking at um, how water moves when and where and not exacerbating it if everybody's doing the same thing at the same time. Um, 
the 1.25 in terms of uh, resiliency, in fact, we're looking at an adjacent street and helping to green the street. Um, and with a lot of pushback from um, a variety of engineering perspectives on, you know, you don't have to do that with the street. So I want to bring up public infrastructure. Um, if we're looking at redevelopment on private land, you know, I think one of the first places to look in terms of water quality and quantity is where, how it's conveyed. And I know that, that you're working um, on this with, with DOT, but um, perhaps even offering uh, regional demonstrations where public and private can work together. Uh, we're looking at 1.5 you know, to just for resiliency, build in a, for water quality. Um, and the question is, you know, are there technologies uh, that can get that kind of performance result while we're also uh, d uh, dealing with volumetrics? Demonstrations are, would be great, um, w w you know, with a number of those criteria in mind where we're, we're pushing technology. Um, so if we've got um, wonderful technologies that are ready to go. They don't get caught up in, you know, two or three years of certification approval. A demo allows you to do that. A demo allows you to look at a systematic regional approach. And then aligning the money, you know, SRF, et cetera, the, the EIB, is it, is it paying for more impact or, or, or is it paying for more conveyance? And perhaps incentivizing that money, that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm in terms of even getting private assets involved. Um, so just something to think about is demonstration. Um, that'll help prove the point. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, I've got, yeah. Hi, uh, Ray Nichols again. Um, you mentioned the problem of empirical data and that it's frequently out of date. Um, periodically, the department has research, pays for research to be done. It th sometimes delays the development of plans. I'm thinking of the water supply master plan, uh, but I think that was delayed for political reasons. And certainly this is a very political topic we're talking about here. Um, but when it comes to retaining water on stormwater on site for a design storm, say one year, um, what's critically important is infiltration capacity of the soil as it exists post-development as well as pre-development. And we've been relying upon models developed by the Soil Conservation Service in the 1950s, 60s. Uh, the data and just plowing farmland over a period of time creates an impervious layer just below the plow layer. Uh, so you need to look at infiltration and have data for, that is site specific if you're going to expect the rules to accomplish what they're proposed to accomplish. You need a lot more specific data. Uh, detention basins are supposed to have two feet of clearance above the seasonal high water table. How often do you get good data, soil survey data, soil boring data, excuse me, that uh, gives you that information. Um, and does it ever get verified? Um, in North Jersey, you've got to worry about depth to bedrock. Is that really taken into consideration anywhere? Uh, again, I mentioned before about the need to um, base rules upon the geologic zone of the state. We've got four major ones. Uh, they've been mapped for a long time. The rules haven't caught up with it yet. Uh, there's science that is uh, very well accepted. You don't have to worry about people questioning the science. Uh, the, and the last thing about um, water quality is the biggest pollutant by volume, and it has lots of effects on chemistry, is sediment. And our rules are not doing a real good job of trapping sediment. Having concrete lined low flow channels through detention basins is the prime example that the department has advocated for for years. But that just means that the next time it rains, all the sediment that was in the concrete low flow channel gets washed downstream. It's really a bad idea. Um, but anyway, that's enough for design stuff. Thank you. I'm not sure.
sure who is. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I just have a, a relatively general question um, relating to sea level rise. So, and existing permits, you mentioned the MS4 permit, um, but how does the DEP plan to factor sea level rise into the various permit types? Like, can you provide specific details if you've already got plans to do so? So that's, and, and that's really what we're engaging everyone here on in the discussion is we're in the process of developing those standards. And so we want to hear from the ideas about how we should approach it, some things that we hadn't thought of before. I've heard a, a number of really great suggestions today uh, that I think kind of underscore what, some of what we were thinking already, some stuff that we hadn't thought of. So don't really have an answer for you yet, um, but that's what, that's what we're here for, to try to listen and understand and learn and so that we can develop. Okay, you got the microphone. Since I'm an old lady, I need practical solutions. I have to tell you that 35 years ago when we moved to our house along the Millstone River, there was a huge storm. Six feet of water on River Road. People were sailing their boats up and down. Because developments were made with a lot of cul-de-sacs, mm -hmm. people couldn't get, out. get to where they needed to go. So because our house is down there and we have some land in the back, we walked up through the back, through the woods, and found a detention basin absolutely empty. And I went to the municipality and I said, I think somebody made a mistake. Oh, no, no, that's the way it's supposed to work. Well, that didn't make much sense to me. And so I traveled around after storms checking detention basins. And lo and behold, they're all empty. <laughs> and then we got low flow channels, which made the situation even sillier as far as that's concerned. So I've come up with a scheme. And the scheme is, let's fix what we've broken as we go forward. The tension basins simply don't work. The water covers the roadways, destroys bridges, destroys houses, messes everything up, and never gets to recharge the aquifer, which is the other side of the coin. So in a dry summer, we have people surrounded who, who have wells, and many of those wells end up going dry. The water needs to be kept where it belongs, and it seems to me the sensible way of doing this is getting rid of detention basins and making retention basins. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the huge number of, of basins that exist now, there must be an enormous capacity there to mm -hmm. hold water mm -hmm. and not get it to run off. So it seems to me the very practical approach would be to find out the volume capacity of what already exists and figure out a way of planting it, making it hold water, um, and, and stop the runoff. And then you start with a much level playing mm -hmm. field in dealing with the increased bad weather that's coming. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think you can move forward to deal with any major storm based on weather change without dealing with what you already have, which simply isn't working. Hmm. So, so what I hear you saying is incentivize retrofitting basins so that they work. Yeah. Trap there the water have been better. people in the state who have been saying this for years. I went to a conference a couple number of years ago where the state forester pointed out that a single tree drinks X number of gallons of huge quantity of water. Mm -hmm. Why are we not taking advantage of nature to do the proper thing. And it's, it's, I'm interested too in your point to, you know, these decisions that were made years ago, and we talked about that decision made 50 years ago to have certain things in certain places and certain design criteria. And so most of you know, the flood hazard rules and the stormwater rules, generally the, 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 the mindset is you can do your thing, just don't make things worse. But maybe that's not the right question. Maybe it's, we need to make it better. We Absolutely. need to make it better in some, in some regard, whether it's water quality or runoff volumes or, or you know, flood storage. So, Absolutely. I now, I'm told by to a ask. number of people that the reason we ended up with these rules was a, a tip-off, a good move for developers who didn't want to develop houses with water because people wouldn't want to buy them. 
or people would object to the mosquitoes that might breed there. Mm -hmm. But that's a very small issue when we're talking about huge amounts of flooding, mm -hmm. which is a very big issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we mentioned before, I mentioned before about updating the design storm requirements. Um, you know, one of the things we have to ask is, 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 is a different storm duration more appropriate because of climate change? Uh, we use a 24-hour duration. Should we use shorter, higher intensity storms? Should it be a two-day two storm? There's a lot of different ways we could approach that. Um, another thing we're looking at, and this kind of goes to your comment about uh, basin resiliency, time to drain, the numbers of days uh, with rain are increasing. Do basins need to drain faster or slower? Do they need to provide more volume? How, you know, how do we adapt to that? Um, and with increasing total rainfall depths, the sizing calculations should use more current data, which we've talked about, um, that accounts for climate change. So there's a lot of different angles that we can approach this on. So I'd like to hear from you. Well, basically, I'm saying I don't think they should drain at all. I think the water should be kept on site, but in a way that's productive. Understood. Thank you. Hi, I have a question about financing and, you know, basically about um, deterring bad actors and enforcement and then also incentivizing. So I'm just wondering, I mean, obviously, I think we all, there's probably isn't anyone in this room who feels that the DEP shouldn't have more staff, that we sh you should be s more staff and have the ability to do more enforcement. And I think with all the rules you're going to be changing and doing, enforcement is going to be key. So hopeful that there will be more staffing and the ability to enforce, that that's important. And on the other side, on the incentive side, I mean, you've got the environmental infrastructure financing program. And I'm just wondering if there's going to be more ability for New Jerseyans to, first of all, have awareness of that, and for that to be able to address um, a, a wide array of level of green infrastructure. So if somebody wants to put in a rain garden or somebody wants to change, you know, keep that water on site to avoid the basins, that there's, you know, zero interest uh, financing, however you want to structure that. So that's available. And if that is the case, then please, please, please also make it you know, easily findable mm -hmm. and accessible because that's always been a problem with, with these kinds of programs like the BPU's clean energy. It's very hard for people to navigate these programs, efficiency programs, but a water program would be wonderful. I know many people who would love to be able to do more so that they're actually helping their community and they already meet the requirements that the municipalities have and they may uh, go above and beyond, but they really want to do even more. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that, uh, could be incentivized. Hmm. Thank you. Um, one of the things that has happened in Pennsylvania, I believe, is the use of um, charging for stormwater that's taken from a site mm -hmm. in the same way that sewage is. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that encourages the owner of the land to get rid of it and reduce it on site, whether it be green roofs or whatever else. And I, I think that's something that's very important. The other thing is that DEP has been encouraging the use of bio de detention and retention basins and uh, what is necessary perhaps so is to make sure that they are adequately sized. Mm -hmm. uh, again, based not on the 100-year storm, but, but a larger sure. storm. Right. Thank you. Yes, hi. I wanted to add to the water quality comments that I've heard so far by saying that it seems to me we will not have a resilient surface water waterway system in our all of our state until we do a lot more and I say we communities but also DEP regulatory actions to restrict the sediments going out the uh, runoff with the fertilizer and all the nitrogen and the phosphorus everyone around this room I'm sure knows what we're talking about and yet, I have not seen an aggressive strategy by DEP to deal with those issues. Our water quality in the surface waters is not good throughout the state. This is a, this is a state that has focused, in my view, and I've been doing environmental law matters since 1988 in this state. I have seen the focus go from industrial point source pollution to, okay, we've kind of got that under control, to this category one waters, let's expand that, all good, 
But when it comes to Category 2 waters, not so much. Now, how can you have a resiliency program, and I think someone said it well, that doesn't build in a much more robust water quality component for these non-point sources? Without that, how can you have long-term fisheries? Will we ever reach fishable, swimmable, Clean Water Act of 1972 levels in this state for more than a sliver of our waterways? I think 5% or something meet that definition today. 65%, as I understand it, are biologically impacted in a not good way. There is a lack of oxygen going into all of these areas so that the fish that thrive, need to thrive, and all the organisms that go into building the, the ecology have enough oxygen. It's all being eaten up. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I see things going on with DRBC, the Delaware River Basin condition, Commission. People study it. People are worried about it. But I'm not really seeing DEP aggressively attack this. And I want this built in as a citizen of this state and a very concerned environmental uh, practitioner. We need to address this. Well, these are, these are all great points, and these are things that we are considering under our, the Phase two stormwater rules, um, addressing a lot of the things that you spoke of. So. Oh, I'm, my name is Roxanne Jane. I, I have a, my own law practice under my eponymously named firm law office of Roxanne E. Jane, LLC. <laughs> <laughs> I practice in and have been in this practice for the past 10 years in Cinnamons and, and also before that in Trenton and came out of other law firms in Mercer County and other counties before I opened up. So I've, you know, I, I'm committed to this and I would also just throw in, I'm a board member of the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary and water quality is a, the focus of that organization improving water quality. I just encourage DEP to do more. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we have time for more questions on this topic or did you want, okay. Yeah. Um, I thought you were gonna get rid of me, didn't you? <laughs> uh, what, one of the ironies of climate change is that as our storms get more intense, we get significantly more rain and significantly less recharge because the storms have become much more intense. We get a lot more runoff. Um, so I, I was glad to see groundwater recharge addressed up here. That definitely needs to be part of this formula. We, we definitely need to update the design storm requirement. I, I'm not sure what the right number is, um, but we're, we're woefully inadequate where we are now, um, which means, which will mean addressing, which mean increasing basin sizing and remembering when we go through the rulemaking process that Flooding is an important component of that. Water quality is an important component of that. Groundwater recharge is an important component of that. We've, we've got to address all three of those. And I want to make sure that we don't lose that recharge opportunity because it's easy to forget when we get all this rain that it, it's actually not doing us any good from a recharge perspective. Thanks. Thank you. Here's a couple. Oh, Ready? Yeah. Sorry. Um, so a couple additional things on stormwater management and talking about sort of the sins of the past. Um, our rules aren't very good at dealing with redevelopment. So, um, and I know we have, you know, CSO issues and long-term control plans, uh, but we also have a lot of smaller communities that are mostly built out. They were built out before stormwater management really came into existence. So having the stormwater rules require quantity quality and recharge requirements in redevelopment and also uh, changing the triggers for major development because a lot of in at least these more developed communities if there is a vacant lot they may not make that you know one acre of soil disturbance quarter acre of new impervious uh, so if we're not chipping away at reducing the pollution coming off those sites we've lost an opportunity um, and then lastly, because it's been mentioned, mentioned a couple times, there's the, there was that stakeholder process for phase two stormwater rules. We now have this EO. The phase two rule talks were partially climate change, redevelopment, nutrients, TMDLs. Any indication of sort of where that is going and how that is going to be incorporated or not incorporated? 
and DEP thinking on uh, the climate change executive order and adoptions? Well, the stormwater rule is an important part of, of this package, so it'll, it'll, it'll be considered, all these changes will be considered as part of that because I don't think you can really have one without the other, right? Um, which I think is what, what I'm hearing from everybody. Um, you know, as far as timing goes, I think it's going to be just overall timing of, of the whole package, right? Yeah. Sort of answered your question. Hi. Um, so I think last year the uh, Flood Defense Act was passed um, that enables uh, local units to develop stormwater utilities. What can um, TEP do in the context of uh, in the context of operationalizing stormwater utilities. Obviously, we need local buy-in to make that happen. Um, but to what extent will any rule changes incorporate uh, guidance or regulations pertaining to stormwater utilities? Yeah, that's that's a good that's a good question. You know, so if, for those that are not familiar, last year the uh, the legislation was adopted. Governor signed it to allow communities, municipalities, to collect funds so that they can, from, from, from land users, so that they can improve their stormwater management system. Because right? that's one of the biggest obstacles, right? You can, if you have enough money, you can kind of do a lot of things. And if you don't have resources, it's very difficult to manage your stormwater. Um, so, you know, I think that that should be part of the conversation. You know, what could the state do? I, I, don't, I don't know. I think that's a, great, that's a great thought, though, that that should be part of the overall discussion. And yep, sure. Could, so the bill requires us to do guidance. My name is Gabriel Mann. I'm the Bureau Chief of the Bureau of Nonpoint Pollution Control and Division of Water Quality. So we are the ones doing the guidance for the stormwater utility law. Um, it gave us 18 months from the effective date, but there was a six month delay in effective. So really it's two years from when the bill was passed. We do plan to have the guidance done before that and are currently working on it, but I couldn't give you an exact date when it's going to be done. To my knowledge, there's not going to be any rule change related to it. It's all, it's just guidance. Thanks, Gabe. Some more thoughts before we move on to coastal resiliency? Well, this has been very helpful. This has been, I think, a great conversation. Um, let's transition now into coastal resiliency um, and our coastal rules. Uh, Colleen Keller will come up and talk about that. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so this is the same as the flood hazard portion of the day where we look for your ideas. We throw out some of our ideas, but want to hear from you. Um, so one of the things that um, our existing coastal zone management rules didn't really contemplate sea level rise. So we had a few ideas. Um, one of the things that are in our coastal zone management rules are coastal centers, which allows for development in the center at a higher impervious cover percentage. Um, so one idea we had, and, and there are centers on the barrier islands. Um, so one idea that we had was to remove those non-mainland centers um, from the barrier islands. Um, when we first started talking about that, we everyone said, well, there's not a lot of area to develop on the barrier island, but there is, after Hurricane Sandy, there are undeveloped areas in Ortley Beach, and with more storms, there could be larger, you know, vast, um, you know, storm-damaged areas where there could be redevelopment. Um, another idea was to create new centers. Um, on the barrier islands where there is less risk, maybe on higher ground, um, to encourage denser development in those areas rather in the centers that are existing currently. Uh, any ideas on, on any comments on that? I'll move to the oceanfront special area. Um, our existing rules, currently staff spends a lot of time um, discussing when applicants come in, um, defining where dunes are, where uh, coastal bluffs are, the extent, the boundaries and beaches. Um, so one of the things that we have to do is to better understand and manage for um, coastal risks and barrier island resiliency. 
and there's one idea to create a coastal buffer zone rather than looking at these special areas individually we could have a buffer zone that addresses the interaction of the special areas and sand transport area rather um, rather than looking at them on an individual basis which would allow us to protect great, have greater protection of that system um, cause currently sometimes if there is a, a the beach ends and then the dune is set back landward sometimes that area is a you know a, we don't really define it in our regulations but it's still important part of the sand transport and um, for the health of the system and that will enable us to do a system-based management approach um, and have applicants look at hydrodynamics geomorphology to assist in our, our decisions on development in that area. Questions? Oh, sorry, I'm the only one. Just a comment, I think the coastal buffer zone is a fabulous idea. I, I for one, think it would, it would help to kind of pull together some of these special areas and, like you said, eliminate some of those no man's land that don't get captured. So I think it's great. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, am I next? Um, yeah, I'm not really sure if, if this is where um, this comment would fit. I, th I think it kind of does with regard to some of the special areas. Um, but uh, one uh, comment from our office related to the large number of uh, federally listed and species being considered for listing um, not only in the coastal front areas but the the coastal marsh areas as well is um, I you know kind of building on what Stan said it's sort of a fraught thing to say from a federal agency so I really want to be sure I'm tying it to our <laughs> jurisdictional responsibilities under Endangered Species Act is that of managed retreat you know there may be some areas where the flood risk is just so high or the erosional pressures are just so high that whether it's through regulation or through blue acres or through state policy or through supporting the locals who want to get out of harm's way that these areas can be uh, returned to a more natural coastal process um, landward migration of our beaches our marshes our uh, intertidal areas um, you know the sea level rise is, is coming and it has a lot of implications for the human um, community which is not our jurisdiction ours is the wildlife um, but the implications are really profound for the wildlife communities as well whether they're going to become inundated whether they're going to get pinched between you know hard structures and uh, infrastructure on the landward margin and the you know the water rushing in from the ocean is really um, I think going to be a fairly a profound um, influence on our ability to recover and, and preclude listing more um, species in these areas so um, you know our, our office you know has a long history of recommending against hard uh, you know building type solutions and more of um, you know soft you know engineering with nature type solutions but I think in some cases a managed retreat has to be part of that calculation and, you know it's federal agency we're not gonna we're not gonna have a lot to say as to when and where that's appropriate but just wanted to make the point that it really does have a lot of impact on habitat availability and habitat quality for piping plover red knot sea beach amaranth we're you know have a proposed rule for black rail we're gonna be looking at salt marsh sparrow um, not to mention the state list of species some of which are also migratory birds so we have an awful lot of interest in how the state handles um, that approach to the coast and where the coast is going to be allowed to operate kind of the way it wants to. Thank you. I'll stand back. Uh, hi, Colleen. This is a, a really tough issue. And I think I said this at the last DEP meeting, the coastal management meetings the other day for access. But um, and until we have some public vetting of what all of us what the Jersey Shore communities want the Jersey Shore to be in this very dynamic way um, we all see high risk so we have to you know step back step up if we want to keep what we have or we have to decide to step somewhere else and and that's a hard decision for everybody and it's a really hard decision for the state to manage but I really think we need a vision that 
looks at those really high risk areas and decides where we should invest and put our foot down and where we need to drift off to somewhere else so i know it's a tough a really tough conversation to have but i think it's an increasingly critical one as we talk about more and more uh, public investment uh, in the in the coast I want to agree this is an incredibly tough landline emotional issue when you start talking and telling people you can't have your beach house where you've always had it because you're going to be underwater. And so th those when we talked, I talked to originally about what are the intentions when we look at infrastructure, either redevelopment or new infrastructure. You know, I think we have to look at coastal resilience and we have to connect it a lot with wetlands. As the, as the sea levels rise, it's going to be more pressure and more impact on water supplies. Uh, inland, and and that's a, a, a very real reality. So we have to connect, make sure to connect coastal with wetlands, right? Because because we have to have as one of our major intentions, drinking water. So I, I would suggest that you know when it's so hard because as an agency, as every agency, everything is in compartments, right? So to look at this holistically is going to be very challenging, but I think it's essential because, for instance, we. Um, we know that that something is barrier islands are, are their barriers and they used to traditionally move and now we've, we've made them hard infrastructure and we know that that's a problem so as our intentions i think this dep needs to look at drinking water we need to look at the economics and the community and there's that whole emotional part we need to look at fish and wildlife right and all of these things and perhaps you you create a um like a, a tiering of what's essential, what, what check boxes when you evaluate should a project be built or not, or, and you work with the community, will this ruin drinking water? And look at all of these different aspects and say, is it okay, it's, it's good for the community, it's good for economics, but people inland or in Manasquan aren't gonna have any water, or it's gonna kill, you know, it's gonna kill off the fish, or it's gonna kill off the birds. So maybe you have these main intentions and you use them as a kind of a guide for evaluating um, something more holistically. And I know this is really super challenging, but I just think, as I said before, we don't know what we don't know, and a lot of these wetlands and water supplies is, are, and drinking water is gonna be impacted in urban and non-urban areas. Okay, uh, John Weber with the Surfrider Foundation. First, I'd love to say thanks for providing snacks. That was very nice of <laughs> DEP. I just wasn't expecting it, it was very nice. Um, so on coastal centers, this second bullet point that says proposed rules could delineate centers in consideration of future inundation flood prone areas. Doesn't that go without saying? Like, if you didn't do that, what would you do? I'm, I'm not really clear what the alternative to that is. Maybe somebody can answer that. Um, so with, and with respect to coastal centers, I mean, if we realize that barrier islands are gonna get pinched from both sides, if we're talking about moving everybody into much more dense development in a narrow, narrow or smaller footprint on barrier islands or anywhere. Um, you know, no more single family homes. Maybe you want to live out here, you got all living condos, whatever it is, uh, that could make sense. But, and I don't know to what extent these rules are gonna address this, but yeah, that's possible if there's a giant pot of money to buy out everybody that has all these single family homes that are in places that are not sustainable. So uh, if somebody could speak to, is that part of these rules or, or anything like that? And then um, probably apropos of nothing that's on this fly slide, I want to kind of echo what Patty just said. Um, you know, Surfrider Foundation would really love to see rules that prohibit hard structures like seawalls, uh, like rock armoring, riprap, things that make the public resource, which is the beach, you know, it maybe it protects private property, but it's going to make the public resource of a beach disappear. Um, you know, I know it's New Jersey, I know this is an uphill battle, but we would love to see some rules that prohibit seawalls, riprap, hard structures, because that's they're not going to protect us anyway. So let's just ban them. Yeah, current our, currently, our rules allow us to, if someone's asking for a, hard, a structural shore protection, they have to go through a hierarchy to prove they can't do non-structural before they go to structural. But that's why we had the idea of the coastal buffer zone, because that allows us sort of a look at the impact of the whole transport of the whole system as well, rather just refraction impact from the vertical structure. So 
it's, that's why it's kind of greater protection. But getting at your, um, the center question, so that was what the, the that's why I, I flipped to the next slide, the middle encourage growth outside of vulnerable areas. Um, we were thinking instead of, um, you know, restrict high rise development in certain areas, but then maybe encourage it, just like you're saying, if you wanna live on the barrier island, go to, you have to live in a condo. Um, so I think eventually, you know, areas will just not be livable, and at least for some communities, for their rateables, which is, we've seen after Sandy, that's so important, that potentially it, where it's high and dry and not so vulnerable, that's where we concentrate the development and maybe have some, some more flexibility in high rise, um, our high rise rules. Um, so, um, hey, Colleen, oh. can I just touch on something? So currently in the coastal rules, we, when the State Planning Commission takes an action where they uh, adopt through the plan endorsement process um, changes to a map, a state, you know, the, to the state plan, um, we, the, then it gets, um, the department receives that and in the coastal rules, we, we do our own evaluation of whether or not that, that uh, we want to use those change centers and nodes and whatever else is on the map for our rules when evaluating whether or not um, the percent uh, impervious cover that can be um, realized on the site. So our current rules don't actually spell out how we go about that examination. So this change that Colleen has highlighted there is putting in the rules so there is a standard in the rule of the evaluation that we're doing. So I get your point, John, that shouldn't we be doing already? And actually Liz Semple here is in the room who is doing that right now at, on behalf of the department with the State Planning Commission and the um, uh, Office of Planning Advocacy, but putting it in the rule and making it something that we um, are required to do, I guess is really the point. So it's not just for a short period of time, potentially, you know. Hi, uh, Brian Kempf, NJFM. I just wanted to make a couple points, and I, I'm speaking as a Barrier Island resident as well as somebody who advocates for protection and stronger standards uh, for flooding and sea level rise. Uh, for one, I just want to say the area for as far as the um, the buffer zone, the area jurisdiction, um, some of the, mo the places where nuisance flooding is already most prevalent um, and where we'll begin to see um, the impacts of flooding more uh, stronger and stronger is along the back bay and along those areas inland from the back bay. This is also like the, uh, the middle of the islands, so to speak. Um, we talk about coastal high hazard areas. Oftentimes we talk about, um, you know, like the dunes and those critical areas. But um, in my experience, the area behind the dunes is often the area that has the highest elevation anyway. Um, and for every section of the coastline that's uh, receding with erosion, there's also areas that are accreting that are continually protected. Um, so I just wanted to advocate, and this might be a statutory change, that um, th there's a need to explore um, looking beyond just waterfront development on the back, uh, waterfront development permits on the back bays, um, particularly because of the, frac the, um, the fractal ownership and, um, you know, like individual municipalities are regulating bulkhead heights and they change from community to community. Um, so we're really seeing huge, vulner huge vulnerabilities on our back bays. Um, second, I, I also wanted to advocate as far as uh, planning goes, um, it's simply not enough to tell uh, municipalities that they have to consider sea level rise for planning. Um, you know, I, I think we saw with a lot of the post-Sandy planning grant applications that many communities were required to address resiliency in their master plans. But um, as we've seen in the years since Sandy, our development patterns have mostly stayed the same. So I think there should be probably some requirement that is requiring beyond consideration, actually requiring action for sea level rise. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to, uh, you know, we talk about coastal areas, we talk about beach houses a lot. I just also want to point out that the um, median household income of people who live on the barrier islands is lower than the state's uh, median household income, that there's a lot of social justice issues with people living in areas that are like enclosures that are below flood level. 
um, and I just want to again emphasize that you know this isn't just people's massive beach houses. This is you know people who like me maybe live in a garden apartment at the shore. People retirees, immigrants who are living in these um, in these uh, fair island communities. So, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, so. Additional ideas are currently in our rules, we have exemptions for infill development. Um, infill development uh, is, if, if you're an infill development, then there's exclusionary criteria, so you do not have to address the coastal high hazard area rule. So you can reconstruct in um, the V zone. Uh, so one consideration we were discussing was eliminating this exemption in vulnerable coastal areas. Uh, there's a, you have a comment? Yeah, I have a question. Um, sorry. So, um, will the DEP uh, be uh, doing any coordination with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, when incorporating sea level rise into permitting? Um, I'm speaking um, with the Hackensack Meadowlands. Like, for instance, Army Corps has jurisdiction there. So, would the DEP have to coordinate with them um, when making changes? Um, to incorporate sea level rise? Uh, well, the Army Corps would have the federal standard. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm assuming we would discuss maybe with them as we're trying to uh, determine where the state is going. <clears throat> but um, so, yeah, we would probably touch base with them. But there's no requirement for us to be on the same page as them. Okay. So, in the Meadowlands, where um, they may have. Uh, the Corps may have chief jurisdiction over a wetland. We're talking about development in the floodplain, which extends beyond the wetland and the state of New Jersey through our Flood Hazard Area Control Act still has uh, jurisdiction over that area. Hi, I've got a very specific question, but it seems to fit in here if you don't mind. Um, if a major development is being planned for less than 100 feet from Little Lake Harbor, Barnegat Bay. When does the NJDEP decide to hold a public hearing? If if they need, if they require a capital permit, which it sounds they like do. it probably does, then um, it goes through the process. If we get enough comment, uh, we get a, we get a comment, and we feel that we can still receive additional information from a public hearing, then we'll choose to have a public hearing. If we don't do a public hearing, there's a public comment period. Um, and so we would receive comment during that as well. So, but a public hearing, it's decided if we think that we're gonna s receive additional information and if there's a, just a extent, you know, extensive amount of comment on a project that we, we have the hearing if we feel like we can get more information. Okay, thank you. How will <clears throat> the rulemaking impact, this is sort of related to the core, but FEMA in terms of um, disaster relief funding, I just saw it, an, uh, study looking at across the country at areas that, like Elkins Park, Maryland, I mean, will continue to get flooded out, will continue to get de disaster relief. Um, the general public pays for all of that over and over again. How, you know, for areas moving forward that are um, where there should not be additional redevelopment, uh, is there any way uh, that this impacts with FEMA disaster recovery money? Um, well, these are rule changes for our coastal zone management rules, which regulate development in the state of New Jersey uh, along the coast. But um, I've, I'm not sure. Um, the, so for um, FEMA, FEMA will continue to run their federal program right. as they do. We do not have a mandate that we have to be... Um, uh, as lenient, I guess, in from your perspective, as they are, we can be stricter. Yeah. In the act, it says how we delineate a floodplain right. should be at least as high as FEMA's. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then yeah. what we allow to take place in that hundred-year floodplain is dictated by a state statute. Right. So the state is always more stringent than what any federal. It, so historically, it, it has been yes, ma'am. So in that event, um, could have some reconciliation of areas where, uh, regardless of a state's 
statute continue to redevelop, you, you would have an impact. Yeah. resiliency plan, then it would not be funded. You know, one of the reasons everybody's pushing to get a lot of resiliency projects in, if they're incorporated in the state's plans, they're eligible for federal funding, correct? I don't know. Yeah, they were here this yeah. morning. It seems it's uh, yeah, are you yeah. suggesting that if, um, they're in some town's resiliency plan, then FEMA will give them funding? If, if yes, under okay. when FEMA announces funding or after the fact, if the properties are damaged, they're mm -hmm. eligible if they're included, the, the, the states approve them as part of the plan. So the state does have some influence um, and it would take a while to take effect, but the mm -hmm. state could help guide what does or what does not or choose to put some of its own funds into Blue Acres or other programs mm -hmm. to provide some other alternatives. Mm -hmm. Well, th that's exactly what we have done is, right, right yeah. is taken our, taken funding and, and put it into um, a buyout program. I don't, I don't know if that answered your question or not, Stan. I think it answered mine. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it answered theirs. Right, so yeah. things are included in the hazard mitigation <coughs> plan and FEMA can fund that but what we saw after sandy was if it was damaged public assistance came in and said you can replace what you had so i mean it's a separate program than cafra i mean if they needed a, a cafra permit then they would have had to have come to us It was just that when you're looking at sea level rise in areas like the Meadowlands in you know Hackensack, New Jersey, that are under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Corps of, Corps of Army, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, excuse me, wouldn't you coordinate with them? Wouldn't you also coordinate with FEMA if it was under their jurisdiction? I mean, yeah, yes. So for that area, they would primarily look at wetlands. Um, so in that aspect, we would consult with them regarding the wetlands impacts. Um, so we are current, we actually have a couple projects we are doing that exact thing. But for the floodplain development, that is a, a separate issue about constructing in the floodplain. Um, depending on zoning, we'd actually coordinate with MIMAC, with the, I'm sorry, not MIMAC, um, New Jersey Sports and Expedition Authority. Um, regarding zoning implications in a floodplain. So, um, but that's, that's kind of the process. Yeah. Uh, Ray Nichols again. Um, as a Unitarian Universalist, one of the principles we adhere to is the interdependent web of all existence. And when we're talking about flood areas, that certainly applies. It's very complex. And um, what I wanted to bring to your attention is I realize that the 50th anniversary of Earth Day is coming up. It is also the 50th anniversary of the establishment of this department. And 50 years ago, Ian McHarg, a landscape architect at the University of Pennsylvania, published a book that was very popular at the time called Design with Nature. And he did something with paper and um, clear plastic that is now much easy, more easily done with a computer. And that is he overlaid different kinds of maps, one on top of the other, to determine which areas are suitable for development and which areas are not. One of the areas that he identified as not suitable for development, meaning commercial, residential, anything, is flood prone areas. That development should be limited to areas that are outside the flood plains. In New Jersey, we've sort of adhered to that, uh, except along our coastal areas. 
Um, and certainly, if you're looking at revising the rules regarding the infill, uh, that would be a good way to start saying, no more infill in flood prone areas. Uh, the other thing, which I think I just heard Ginger re uh, refer to, which could get a lot more reference at this time, is uh, if people feel like they've lost the value of their little house, that they're a poor uh, family, that as many of the permanent residents on the Barrier Islands are, that they'd be bought out through the Blue Acres program. And I recognize that's voluntary, but they may be more willing to consider a negotiated settlement and uh, purchase their property by the state. It would have the additional advantage of providing additional points of access to the beaches, which is something that the general population of the state would like to see. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. So the last thing, is there the oh, last thing? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, Maeve Desmond with Inside Engineering. Um, I had a question about the future inundation zones and how you would expect those to be delineated. <coughs> Do you think that would be consistent with whatever standard is adopted for the flood hazard area rules um, for delineating the flood hazard area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yes, possibly that would be. Um, so right now, um, and we were talking about the back bay flooding that happened after Sandy. So the the possible creation of a future inundation zone would address that, and it would probably be similar to where the sea level rise, you know, create an area that is a permanent inundation area in the future. And then we could create a new special area rule to limit certain types of development. If someone came in for a permit in that area, they might have to do a risk analysis, like a resiliency assessment to see if they, you know, to, to look at their design build and acknowledge that there's risks of building in that area and um, construct so that they understand they're going to be exposed to storm surge and erosion and future sea level rise. Um, that would minimize loss of properties and reduce overall impact to other coastal resources in the area. So probably it, it would depend on how we would map that out, but that's it's sort of thought the, in the Back Bay area where we saw a lot of flooding, and then we will see when sea level rise comes up. So, the other question I had was regarding the coastal buffer zone. Do you also have you thought about the methodology of how you would delineate that area? Uh, because I know there's some ambiguity as it is now with how a, you know, for example, a dune limit is determined. Would it be you know a line plotted on a map? to create the coastal buffer zone or still? No, I think it would still require, it would be the sand transport area. So I think it would still require an analysis of where it's not, you know, a landward edge that's not functioning any longer, but it would get us out of individual, looking at individual resources rather than a linked system that um, feeds to each other. So we would still have to do it on a case by case basis because the New Jersey coastline is totally different everywhere. No other questions? I'm going to start moving to renewable energy. Diane Dow from Land Use. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, so I am going to talk about um, renewable energy and green building design. So um, our current rules, they do allow limited um, <coughs> uh, renewable um, energy projects, um, but with the state's goal um, of having clean energy by 2050, I guess the question is, do we need to make changes to our rules to uh, encourage more renewable energy projects, or do we make, need to make our rules easier uh, to obtain a permit for those types of projects? Um, the other topic is green building design. So our rules currently are silent on green building design. Um, so some of the questions are, do we want to, in our stormwater rules, require that new construction of certain types of development must be designed with a, a green roof or a white roof? Um, and 
uh, or in our old, in the CAFRA rules at one time, many years ago, we had um, standards for low flow faucets, low flow toilets. Are they things that we want to put back into our coastal rules? Um, so uh, we could talk about, you want to talk about renewable first? Anybody have any questions, suggestions, ideas? Excuse my ignorance. Is a white roof literally a white roof? Or, yes, like okay. Because a, cool a green roof isn't necessarily literally green. Yeah, I didn't true. know if we were yeah, literally talking about a white, white roof. roof. <laughs> it is a white roof, just like you know, you're told you're not to wear black in the hot sun because it absorbs the heat. The white reflects the heat. Makes so perfect sense. That's why I had to ask. <laughs> Just on encouraging renewables, uh, ab absolutely, and we support encouraging renewables. We want to make sure that it is cited appropriately, that uh, the rules, you know, that we don't uh, cut down forests or trees, uh, as we've seen in the past, that we don't have, uh, we don't use good farmland for large-scale projects. We want to make sure that they are responsibly cited, and we don't, we wouldn't want to see a weakening. Um, of those of those rules, and conversely, when it comes to fossil fuel siting, we would like to see you know a strengthening of the public benefit aspect of the Freshwater Wetlands Protection Act, and and it, we talk keep talking about those intentions, like right? this is all about protecting against climate threats, right? So I think that's that holistic approach, and we want to see, we'd like to see the public benefit um, portion of the Wetlands uh, Protection Act really. Uh, discourage fossil fuel infrastructure as not being in the, in the public benefit. Uh, I'd like to agree with that and also talk about um, trees and see if there's a way to get trees written into these ideas about green building, not just green roofs, but minimal removal of trees, no clear cutting, um, Maybe if trees are removed, they need to be replanted somewhere else. Uh, but somehow, trees are one of our most valuable resources for carbon sequestration, and yet they seem to be left out of nearly every plan which relies on things like infrastructure and power generation, uh, whereas a natural thing like a tree can do this quite easily. The difficulty is managing, keeping people from going, um, finding ways around the ruling. But so many, uh, New Jersey's under an onslaught of development from warehouses that are increasing hardscape services, impermeable surfaces, runoff surfaces all over the state because we're in between where people are and where they need to be. And what's happening is that we have rules and meanwhile, our impermeable surfaces are being removed from our landscape. And that, if there's some way to write that into the ruling, that any new perme impermeable surface should result in an increased permeable surface. Did I say that? <laughs> if there's some way to offset, the same way that we have carbon offset, can we have permeable surface offset? This may be a novel idea, maybe it's a crazy idea, but can we think about it? In the, just a follow-up question on that, for the, um, your question on the trees, are you talking about um, upland areas outside of the areas that we currently regulate, or are you talking about within our current regulatory authority, like the riparian zone, transition areas? Um, no, it could be flood hazard, yeah, it could be freshwater wetlands, be right. Okay. Thanks. Hi, Peter Blair, Clean Ocean Action. I'm very excited that the department is considering a green roof requirement. Uh, I would encourage you to look at the San Francisco model, which both has um, flexibility in its regulatory system, one that allows for uh, living roofs in a place where it's uh, most beneficial for where you don't want new impervious surface but uh, also solar to be a requirement of that for where it makes most sense. I think that that creates a little bit of flexibility that 
would incorporate the responsible development of renewable energy that the state's so concerned about. Hi. Um, I've heard, uh, from my understanding, the, the greenest building is the one that already exists, and I just want to point out that um, refurbishments of existing building, historic preservation, um, we could, should consider these as part of the toolkit beyond just incentivizing the creation of new renewable and eco-friendly buildings. Um, there's a lot of embodied energy that goes into new buildings from trans transporting building materials to the site to um, all the trees that get cut down from that, whereas like in New Jersey we have um, a tremendous existing building stock and a large number of, uh, of uh, buildings and in many cases it's economical to refurbish the buildings we have now and I think that should be um, incentivized in addition, like retrofits uh, should be incentivized in addition to um, encouraging new building construction. So. Thank you. We need to revise the rules so that we quit putting solar arrays on green space. Um, I, I love solar energy, I really do, but we have more than enough uh, impervious cover in this state and we need to find a way uh, to revise the rules so that we don't allow that uh, to take up green space anymore. Um, it's a renewable energy issue, it's also a stormwater issue. Uh, functionally, there isn't much difference between 60,000 square feet of solar panel and 60,000 square feet of roof. Um, and we've got better things to do with our, our green space than that. Um, so I think we need to find some way with either within the rule or, or if, if we need something outside the rule to, to revise that to make sure that we uh, put the preference to putting it elsewhere. De developers will develop solar arrays on green space for the same reason they develop residential properties or warehouse buildings on green space because it's cheaper and easier for them to do it that way and we need to quit making it that. Thank you. Um, I'd like to agree with the last few people who spoke and I think that um, the uh, statement about the best, the greenest building is an existing building I think is, is a very important one. But I think it's also in terms of locating um, solar energy and so on, in addition to not putting it on agricultural and other green spaces, one ought to, ought to consider the historic aspects of landscape corridors as well. I think that's very important. The other thing is about, I certainly think that ex uh, green building, green roofs and white roofs are very important, but probably the place to do that is with the building code rather than with, with this sort of, uh, these sort of things. I think it's important and that's probably where it can be most effective and directly implied. Thank you. I would uh, echo the uh, encouragement to require or create rules that would uh, create more incentives for green roofs and white roofs. Um, you know, when you have areas of densely populated areas that provides stormwater storage or stormwater uh, retention so it hits the system later. I mean, Philadelphia is doing a lot of that. Um, also, regarding building codes, I know it's not DEP's purview, but bringing our building codes up to current standards so we have more energy efficient buildings or using energy more efficiently is vital. Um, and then our freshwater wetlands rules, our flood hazard rules should really take into consideration what kind of developments are there. So creating developments that increase our reliance on fossil fuels or allow fossil fuels to go in just like we would, uh, you know, allow any other project is really working counter to the resiliency and the protection and the climate change uh, requirements. Uh, just a couple comments. Um, yeah, adaptive reuse is always a, a good thing uh, in terms of buildings. Uh, in terms of, uh, and I, I agree, renewable energy should be incorporated. Uh, buildings contribute 30 to 40 percent of greenhouse gases. So um, New York is going to have an impact. It could be interesting how that relates economically with Jersey, but certainly um, circular economy businesses will be, will be driven. 
And um, a comment on, on energy, geothermal, you don't hear a whole lot about it. Um, we're looking at wind and, and adaptive, re all those kinds of things at the site, our site. And geothermals come up because of high groundwater table where it, we're, we're, we're seeing that it's more cost effective. It, I mean, there's a lot to that, which is why we need more data research and those kinds of things as well when we move out with these, these efforts. But um, to, to make sure there's a breadth of renewable energy address that uh, doesn't have an impact in terms of carbon, greenhouse gas, you know, we're EV, we're excited about the EV legislation. Um, that's a, a, a huge growth industry. And uh, New Jersey is one of the most populated states, so we're excited to see where that goes. But then how much is the grid going to be impacted if we're not really moving towards um, better technology, cell technologies in terms of renewable energy? So I think wherever there can be an alignment with rulemaking in the state, just as we've talked about water and energy and water and climate and in our ecosystems, same thing here in uh, driving the, the focus on better technologies with renewable energy. Thank you. Just a question about um, incorporating appropriate standards for renewable energy. Can you, can you give a couple of examples of what you've been considering on that well, front? Um, we're actually here to hear from you guys. <laughs> um, but um, you know, we, we obviously want to talk. We want to make sure that we have responsible site selection. You know that we've heard here from everyone. That's very important. We understand that. Um, but uh, I haven't heard much about wind, so I don't know if, if anybody has any comments on wind. I do actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, it, or it doesn't have to be wind, but in general. Um, you know, getting down into the weeds in, in some of these projects that are, that are being talked about, there's, there's still, everything we do has impact, right? So even the greatest renewable energy, there, there's an impact associated with that. So are we talking on a level of, if there's an impact associated with a renewable energy project, say there's a connection cable coming from offshore wind and crossing tidal creeks, mm -hmm. are we, talking about maybe treating that kind of infrastructure and the impacts associated with that differently than we would, let's just use an oil pipeline, right? With, with a same linear comparison, right. is, is that potentially what we're talking that's about? That's the okay. question, yes. Is it, should we make our rules easier for those types of projects? So if, if I have an hypothetically, if there's an oil pipeline crossing a tidal creek and there's a electric cable crossing a tidal creek, the same, I don't know in what world this would happen, but the same square footage, the same acreage of impacts, mm -hmm. there would be some, there would be some potentially because that electric cable is associated with a renewable energy project, it might be treated differently. That's the question, right? Sorry. I can't hear you. Okay, thank you, Jen. So <laughs> you're saying potentially the purpose and need would have a, a higher weight because the purpose and or need is directly related to, or not. That, that, was, or that not. was the suggestion this morning. And yes, that, that uh, the public interest analysis would be um, the place that you would contemplate, um, you know, a, an oil pipeline versus a wind cable. I think first off, I just have to say that there's no comparing the two just in terms of potential impact of a, let's say, 36-inch oil pipeline or natural gas pipeline to a, uh, to a, a wind turbine uh, cable, connecting cable. However, I, I don't think anyone would want a weakening of rules 
to put down, to put a turbine, uh, any cables or renewables infrastructure through. We still want the rules to be met and to be done as safely and carefully and as protectively as possible. I think what we, all, a lot of people would also like to see, as I mentioned earlier, in that instance you use the word need or public good, but it's under public benefits. You've got it in your rules. And uh, I think it would be really uh, beneficial for the state of New Jersey if that public benefit rules, and I believe it's another Freshwater Wetlands Protection Act, is made more specific and clearer that really cites the harms of fossil fuel infrastructure. And not it's not just cl climate change harms. It's the massive harms of, of, um, of uh, the potentials for spill and safety <laughs> issues and all different kinds of things. So public benefit and, is, and, the, and, the, and the other infrastructure that goes along with it, like compressor stations. So all of that could go under public benefit um, and, and that through that analysis and clearly uh, you know, it has much, much greater impact on New Jerseyans for a lot of bad reasons, fossil fuels. Anything else? All right, thank you. All right, I'm going to cover Anything else that you may have? So quick, <laughs> a, a quick little um, session. So um, just to kind of frame up the conversation a little bit, we have um, been talking about potential changes to the rules and the implementation of some of the regulatory changes that have taken place over the years. So. For example, under our flood hazard area program, we have quite a number of permit by rules. Some people mentioned some of those permit by rules already. And what we're finding is that applicants are coming in for jurisdictional determinations to ensure that they meet the permit by rule. And that's problematic. So there is either a problem with the rule or somehow with the implementation of it at the local level. So we have, um, we have under consideration perhaps changing that from a permit by rule to something that the department takes a look at since we are already taking a look at it with no fee. So, um, and it's taking quite a bit of staff time to look at those JDs. So that just, to sort of frame up, but this part of the session is an opportunity for all of you to share with us some additional thoughts. Now, we did have a lot more slides on our slide deck, but we recognize we had a lot of people and we weren't able to put them in. So one thing um, that was mentioned earlier this morning that we had taken out is um, uh, making it easier to do environmentally beneficial projects such as nature-based solutions, living shorelines. That is also on our, our list of potential changes just to maybe um, help out with that. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have a mic? Yep. I do. Um, that was one of the things I was going to mention, so thank you. Yes, uh, we would definitely support addressing environmentally beneficial projects in a, in a different manner than we address other projects. Um, among the regulatory changes that DEP needs to consider is the Highland or are the Highlands rules. Um, I don't know if this applies also to the Pinelands. It, it may, um, uh, but we need to make sure that we're addressing climate change in the Highlands rules. And I realize it's slightly outside of the, the what we're discussing today. But the Highlands Regional Master Plan doesn't address climate change at all, uh, and the Highlands Act does not address climate change. So the Highlands Council itself needs to address uh, the climate change issues, but it also needs to be handled within DEP's regulatory structure. Um, in, onto a slightly separate, well, a completely different subject. Um, has consideration 
Coming back to the coastal issues, has consideration been given to um, addressing some of the climate change issues through uh, regional planning for the coast, something similar to the Pinelands or Highlands, uh, instead of addressing it municipality by municipality? That's it. Thanks. Um, so currently, um, as I mentioned earlier, in the um, coastal rules, we do have um, a connection to the state plan. And when a community goes through plan endorsement, the state of New Jersey is involved and the DEP is involved in that conversation to operationalize the changes at the State Planning Commission into our coastal rules. We ha do have a procedure outlined there, um, which is what we are as I mentioned earlier, considering incorporating criteria of what we would expect a community to the review we'd expect them to undertake when wanting to change their planning area designation. Okay, so that's how we, um, at a state level, incorporate planning into our coastal rules. Um, first off, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to make some comments on these rules. Um, it's something we talk about a lot in our office, just some of the hurdles that, you know, from the state that maybe you don't necessarily know or understand. So just being able to talk about it is, a, is really great. Um, Wendy and I are speaking for our office, and we just wanted to make sure that we could get a chance to get uh, our office's thoughts out to you guys. Um, and I'm glad I'm going after this gentleman who was talking about kind of planning on a landscape perspective because uh, some of these recommendations speak to that. Um, one, in ensuring that there's aquatic and land connectivity for fish and wildlife in any sort of future planning. I'm not sure if there's a specific rule that you could apply to that, but if there was some sort of landscape planning um, to consider that. Um, and then, because the state does a lot of the back bay dredging, we would like to recommend uh, land use to work with DOT and strategically planning for the beneficial use of dredge material for not only the marshes, but also the communities that depend on those marshes for flood, um, flood mitigation and uh, buffering some of the storm energy. Um, we'd like to see the sediment remaining in the system instead of being put elsewhere. And we'd like that uh, the use of upland disposal facilities be discouraged if that could be put in the, the rules in any sort of way. Um, and if we could encourage some sort of systematic programmatic approach for the back bay dredging in New Jersey, let's put that sand back on the beaches. Let's put those finer sediments back on the marshes. Um, and specific to uh, any sort of <clears throat> beneficial use of dredge material, we'd like to talk about um, confinement of sediment requirements. So when we're putting that dredge material on the marsh, maybe lifting any sort of confinement requirements that uh, that that may be um, a hurdle for some of these projects. We find that uh, for some of the restoration projects, our office and other refuge offices have been involved in not confining the material, allows it to settle more naturally. So that's a, a great way to um, use that and, and help elevate the marsh. Um, and we've also found that there's some SAV and shellfish restrictions that are creating hurdles, not only to the dredge projects, but also to some other restoration projects. And in a lot of cases, it's not submerged aquatic vegetation. We're finding that it's a macroalgae. So somehow, maybe even um, updating the, the SAV mapping, that could be one way to solve that issue. Um, we think the state would benefit from strategically using their own sediment. We think that there's a cost savings there, especially if there's something programmatic that, that could be created um, in the long term. I think that would be a huge cost savings. And it, it benefits these coastal communities as well. Um, and then the other thing, and you touched on this, was develop um, some state incentives for nature-based solutions to control erosion and flood issues. In Chesapeake Bay, they have like some property tax um, lifts. That's a great incentive. So if you're not going to build a bulkhead and you instead decide to plant um, a wetland in front of your house, maybe you don't have to pay taxes on that parcel of land. Um, or maybe consider a bulkhead tax and you could use that funding to help municipalities engineer and implement nature-based solutions to control their erosion and flood issues. 
Um, and I already talked about that. Um, and then I had one other uh, suggestion from a gentleman in our office who wanted, you brought up the Blue Acres program. Um, and, and the federal government also acquires land and we're willing to take some of that land from um, folks that might have private lands that they, they don't want to develop on anymore. And in a lot of cases, that land can be used as a mitigation for other projects. But we're finding an encumbrance um, basically According to um, Steve, the problem is that um, currently state regulation requires a conservation easement be placed on mitigation properties. And so we can't assume ownership and that creates an encumbrance and we can't purchase that land from the landowner if there's a state conservation easement. So we're wondering if you would consider um, if we had something in writing from the landowner saying that they are going to uh, sell their property to, let's say, our refuge system, that you would make an exception to that conservation easement requirement. Wendy, did you have anything else you want to add? Um, I'll only just add to what Danielle said on the connectivity point. Um, I'd really like to commend the state for all the great work. I understand there was a new connectivity rules, is that right? Not all that long ago. Um, and the great work coming out of the change project, so to map connectivity. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that with regard to fish and wildlife resources, in light of climate change, you know, species may have greater need not only to migrate um, over the longer term, you know, over the period of you know, decades, but they might have greater needs for sh um, short-term movements in response to droughts or floods or other types of climate-driven, uh, you know, weather sto stochasticity. So connectivity will just become all that more important. And I just encourage you to keep building on the, the great work that you've already done, um, trying to improve connectivity for our wildlife. And even plants, they have to move too. <laughs> just, they do it slower. <laughs> Those are great comments. I, w I want to thank the uh, state for the opportunity for all of us to contribute. A lot of people have mentioned sound science and science-based decision-making today. Uh, science takes good information, and the department's been uh, incredible in its commitment to better understanding the Barnegat Bay. And you know, we've worked with you closely on that, along with many other groups around the state. And I, want, uh, I just want to reiterate that thanks. But uh, as the, the uh, state and our world continue to change, uh, a continuing co commitment to, to that science and monitoring becomes even more critical and important. And I just want to put that on the table. And uh, thank you again uh, for the support of the, the coast. Thank you. Hi, Emily Lamond. Um, I have one discreet comment and suggestion and then one larger question. Uh, the suggestion being I would certainly encourage uh, DEP to um, create opportunities or um, uh, an application process um, uh, in the context of jur the jurisdictional determinations for the flood hazard um, uh, to correct for any inaccuracies uh, in the mapping, which are inherent um, and there are certain limitations to the data. So if you have a property that's mapped in, say, the 500-year flood area but uh, is actually uh, should not be um, we'd want to have some um, application process to be able to get out of the jurisdiction. Um, and then the larger question is, um, what are our data options um, to follow up on, on um, given how data-driven uh, this process is? I, I know we're looking to NOAA precipitation data, but um, is, are, are we relying on FEMA data, NOAA data, um, Rutgers? I mean, what, what type of options are there? I think we're considering all data at this point in time. This is, we're in our, um, the phase of rulemaking where we're gathering comments. From those comments, looking at the information that was fed into um, the department, as well as internally having sessions. And as we pointed out in the beginning of the session, what sort of prompted a lot of um, conversation was the real hard science that we, was provided to the department from Rutgers. Um, we certainly can't ignore that science. And so, but everything is under consideration. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
Um, mention was made of special use areas that Heinlands and the Highlands and the need to incorporate the sustainability uh, and resiliency in there as those areas as well. There's another area of special use, which is the DNR Canal Commission area, which should also be included, I think. And I, I just want to think to just say that I think it's very important to recognize the importance of corridors, scenic, natural, historic, and wildlife corridors as important things to keep in consideration that are very important for everything here. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the department has done basically a pretty good job, but uh, I think this should never be forgotten. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, f I feel a little funny asking this question because it could be totally off base or I'm completely missing something, but why aren't we talking about CAFRA here? If this is the rule and the law that governs what can be built and how it can be built in the coastal zone, I, I'm just not, I don't understand why we're not talking about that a lot. If there's a sh quick short answer, I'll take it because then I have a comment. Um, we, we are and we have been. The, so um, Colleen's presentation mm -hmm revolved around the rules on coastal management. The upland portion, while waterfront, we have a some jurisdiction of the upland area. It was predominantly the CAFRA permits that um, we, we would encounter those issues regarding developing on a dune, okay. things so, like that. Yeah, so, so CAFRA is under. In the list of those initial mm -hmm. rules we were talking about, it wasn't listed, but I get that. Um, it, it's folded into the rules on coastal zone management. That's what I've I okay. was guessing. So um, I guess the comment is then I, I think all of this goes back to kind of what Stan asked originally, which is are we trying to keep people out of these areas or are we just trying to make it so people can live in these areas more safely or, or you know, and, and I don't think we've answered that, but I guess I'll ask a, a historic question. What was the approach, you know, when CAFRA was first created? I mean, was it let's allow people to live in these areas mm -hmm. and just do it and you know build these buildings in a certain way or was it mm -hmm. to let's try and keep people from living in these areas do you know which mm -hmm. one it was well when if you look at the CAFRA legislation it really does reflect the balancing of the um, importance of the coastal zone to the economy as well as the importance of the resources in that coastal zone so it was the use of it as uh, for recreational reasons and uh, the law itself reflected the type of development that uh, the department was to uh, examine. And so when you look at that original rule book, it uh, had that same balancing of allowing some development to take place, but limiting it, um, that development when it came to a special area. Okay, and just um, like, again, just mm -hmm. a mindset as we go forward. If you take one statistic from Sandy, at 364,000 houses were damaged or destroyed mm -hmm. in Hurricane Sandy, mm -hmm. we have to, you know, uh, in reference to CAFRA, well, was that a CAFRA complete failure or was that somehow great? Like, mm -hmm. in my opinion, most of those houses shouldn't have been there, so we would have had a lot less damage. Some people yeah. might think CAFRA was great because it wasn't mm -hmm. a million houses or something. You know, I'm just, yeah. so going forward, mm -hmm. just that could inform how we're looking at it. Yeah, so a lot of that development was not CAFRA regulated. It was, um, so when CAFRA was passed, for, from a residential perspective, it was um, uh, proposing a development of 24 or more units. And a lot of those houses were developed one at a time. And then, of course, when CAFRA 2 came into effect, that first use of one home to that water's edge was triggered and needed a, an authorization but pretty much at that point in time, most of the shoreline already had a home on it. So, My question is, yes, I think it's a wonderful idea to relook at a whole lot of rules to find better ways to protect the environment. But I'm wondering how, with this whole assemblage of information, do you assess priorities and where is funding coming from? for the things that need to get done? Um, from a regulatory perspective, um, we don't need funding to, um, we already have the funding to write the rules. Um, as far as funding to do more science, that 
that we may have to seek out additional assistance for. But we generally look to our science advisory board to sort of start that conversation, uh, work with our partners and universities. Um, so, And the first part, assessing priorities, so what has to be dealt with first, the most important mm -hmm. thing, well, the secondary mm -hmm. things. The EO actually uh, assigned priorities to us. So we're going to use the EO as our guide to we definitely need to address the things the governor expects us to address, um, what our commissioner expects us to address through her AO, and then everything else that we can get done in this, um, as, as I highlighted in the beginning, a fairly short period of time this uh, first wave of, of regulatory changes. What is also important is enforcement, and that does require revenue. Yeah. <laughs> um, who has a mic? Right so there. Ginger, again, thank you for this opportunity. Um, a couple things. So with our wetlands buffers, our riparian zones, making sure those stay intact, so making it harder to make those incursions. Uh, and I see not infrequently, and I forget which way it works mostly, but if I am going to reduce the riparian zone and I get a credit for protecting the riparian zone, but that's really a wetlands transition area, I've not really functionally protected that waterway and vice versa, I haven't protected that wetland. So not allowing applicants, not allowing the regulatory community to double count protections. So if I'm taking it away from a segment I really need to provide a functional improvement somewhere, not double counting it. Um, so I see that quite frequently in some development applications. And then I'm curious with the with the, the example you have up there. So I know the permit by certification is a relatively new one and DEP has the opportunity to go back and take a look at what was submitted. And you don't really have that opportunity with the permit by rules. What has the department's experience been with applicants going with permit by certifications? Are they really meeting those standards? And it has been, you know, validly issued or has the department have, have to gone back to the applicant and saying, no, you made a mistake. You really need an individual permit or you don't meet the requirements. So I think that would be something to take a look at in order to determine whether this is a at least from an example you have up there, a positive move or something that needs to be tweaked better. Mm -hmm. that, it's definitely part of the examination is the success of the general permit by certifications. The ones that are successful are generally the ones that are very prescriptive and um, it's not, there's not, there's no gray. And, and there has been general permits by certifications which we have rescinded. Um, with uh, considering some of the regulatory changes, it would be helpful if there was a, a facilitated path for research. You know, a lot of the different MBI, uh, nature-based infrastructure techniques, you know, they're either innovative locally or they've been, you know, applied elsewhere but haven't really been tested here. So having a pathway that would allow for testing, you know, with, you know, uh, explicitly defined goals, uh, outputs, you know, methodologies for assessing the data would be helpful. And it, it would also be helpful if there was uh, a method for deciding when that nature-based infrastructure was now maybe incorporated into a landscape. Like when a living shoreline stops being an engineered structure but is now part of the landscape. So that way it might not be susceptible to different sorts of licensing fees, sort of like tidelands licenses, things like that. I just wanted to talk about um, marsh migration and the impact of the 1970 coastal wetland maps. Um, I know that's a change to the act, but I feel like in this discussion that it's kind of a, a necessary process that should be pursued, particularly as those marshes start moving or, you know, either naturally or intentionally. Thank you. Yes. In the back. Okay. Hi. Um, 
So speaking more specifically to back to permitting um, with the waterfront development permits, um, does DEP have any intention of looking at sea level rise with respect to waterfront facilities? So more specifically like airports and coastal areas um, or tunnels or bridges? Um, are we considering sea level rise projections at this point or is it with stakeholder um, engagement? You mean currently when you're applying for a permit? Today? Yeah. So, well, no, moving forward, are you already considering sea level rise projections when? Mm -hmm. Yes, we um, are considering regulatory changes to incorporate sea level rise into our decision making. What that looks like is has yet to be um, determined. That's part of the stakeholder process is to really get feedback from practitioners and other interested parties on how to approach that. Okay. And overall, um, when you're reviewing permits, um, do you look at the condition of time? Like, are you looking progressively at maybe at other states? I know that in previous sessions when we were talking about the EGUs and non-EGUs, we mentioned that we were looking at New York State and also Massachusetts at what they were doing. So is New Jersey DEP also looking at that with regard to climate change? Like for instance, um, in New York, they're already doing something. The New York State DEC is already, um, they have the CRRA, it's a Community Resiliency Risk um, Act, I believe. And so they are incorporating that into their permitting process. So does DEP have any intention in New Jersey of doing something similar along those lines? Um, or are you still looking at the what the areas that are currently uh, regulated um, with mean high water uh, levels and wetland delineations? Like, I'm just wondering if you're including sea level rise um, on top of permitting um, moving forward. Yes, that's part of the regulatory reform that we are considering is folding in sea level rise. And um, let me just point out that when Rutgers did their um, prepared, Rutgers prepared um, actually a couple different papers to DEP. One of the papers looked at how other states are implementing and folding sea level rise into their decision making. So the department has that where they looked at New York State and other states around the United States, California, Massachusetts, as you pointed out, Rhode Island. And, and, um, and then on top of that, Rutgers did a report to show where sea level rise is happening and the probability for um, depending upon uh, the projection you choose. So right now the department is considering which probability perhaps to utilize and then learning from what other states have done how we may want to fold that in. But currently your permits don't require anything along the lines of sea level rise. Currently, um, no, there is no special area rule that says this is sea level rise. Um, we do have um, our flood hazard rules that uh, look at resiliency from the standpoint of using the best available maps now, but no, not looking at where sea level is going to be. Thank you. Well, I just want to first of all, thank you so much, all of you, for all these stakeholder meetings and for taking the time to really hear from everyone. It's, we very much appreciate it. Uh, I would like to reiterate what the watershed said, that we, we really want to see a strengthening of buffers and riparian zones and also a strengthening of, of mitigation and enforcement so that uh, it really actually has some meaning and there's some teeth. And obviously, that might mean you all need more staff to do this, and hopefully you'll have the funding to do that because we know that there's it's a you know there's so many projects and so much development, and only so many of you and enforcement really needs to be funded so that mitigation means something, and there's follow through. Uh, the other piece that uh, we would like to see in terms of the uh, permits by rule, general permit versus individual permit, and I know Vince, we've talked about this before years ago. I think uh, it's horizontal directional drilling. We are not of the opinion that HDD is a safe process. It comes with many, many risks, and every stream, every crossing needs to be looked at 
individually, and that should never be uh, under a general permit. Um, HDD should definitely be excluded from that list it, um, of that. And uh, just in general, um, we really hope are hopeful. I know it's your intention to be as comprehensive across agencies with these rules as possible. So the BPU, agriculture, all of the all of the agencies that impact the environment and human health and climate change and energy. Uh, also in inside of the DEP uh, divisions. But as has been said before, we really want to see comprehensive uh, rules that go through the different commissions and councils, whether it's Pinelands or Highlands or the DNR, the DRBC, uh, and the title council as well. So it, it's just important not only that it's comprehensive, but there's a consistency so that they get the memo. Because sometimes those councils and commissions do not act according to New Jersey's rules and laws. And they just seem there has been a history of this. We have seen this. Uh, there's a lot of politics in a lot of these commissions and councils, and we understand that. But we hope that you all can create rules in a way that really helps strengthen the state's ability to have good oversight of all of these councils and commissions. And it's consistent with what you create. I know it's a long day for you, um, and I know that I understand that Reggie and uh, TCI came up. I uh, just want to mention that um, wherever there are opportunities for the rulemaking to encourage innovation in terms of, of enhanced carbon sequestration, many of the nature-based solutions that we talked about today, regenerative restoration will do that, um, and also to incentivize early, adopt, early adopters in innovation. Um, get everyone thinking and acting ahead for you to prove the point, the demonstration um, comment that I made earlier, uh, where you can um, provide incentives for that. That might be um, you know, for large landholders who are working with their municipalities and counties that want to retreat um, uh, voluntarily. It would be great to help with that um, with uh, cheaper public money, for example. Uh, all of the, these kinds of things we f found have been difficult uh, to actually increase resiliency. Um, so, you know, there may be some opportunity uh, to move out with some risk taking without being overly prescriptive that allows for demonstration and incentivizing that so that that can be evaluated. And those, those are also opportunities to provide public and private research money uh, to solve the problem, because there's just not enough public money. We know that. Anybody else? All right. Um, the survey that I mentioned earlier, the ability to take in um, public comments, is actually now live on the NJPAC website. Um, if you go onto the website, there'll be across the top of the, the um, uh, screen is a bunch of topics. One of it is survey. You click survey. Then there will be a drop down box. Do you want to make comments on air? Do you want to make land use comments? You click on land use and it will give you um, a selection and ability to type in free text. So we encourage people to submit their comments through that avenue. That would be very helpful if you have additional things that you would like to share with us. And you can also send in written comments, as I mentioned before. Jill Aspinwall will be our point person collecting any additional comments that you're not putting in through the uh, portal. All right. Oh, John. Yeah. The, uh, the mode of uh, submitting written mm -hmm. comments, is the, the portal, portal preferred? Yeah, the portal is going to populate a spreadsheet, so there is some um, use of IT to help us in our management of this um, set of comments that are coming in. But either way, you know, whatever is easiest for you, please submit your comments in that manner. If nobody has anything else, I want to thank everyone for taking time out of their day. Great comments. This is a great conversation. 
um, and we really do appreciate everything is, is is under consideration so feel free to continue to share there is no crazy idea out there we're, we're willing to hear anything that people have to offer so thank you